This is Jocko Podcast number 378 with Echo Charles and me, Jocko Willink. Good evening, Echo. Good evening. I was in his control as soon as we stood close to each other. I had no time to even hold or grapple him. I was taken into the ground and I got choked at first. It was difficult to breathe. I felt it working, enough so I was wondering if I should tap as I promised Carlos. Well, this is what I've never told anybody before. It seems I went unconscious while I was thinking about what to do, to give up or not. If Kimura had continued to choke me, I would have died for sure. But since I didn't give up, Kimura let go of the choke and went into the next technique. Being released from the choke and the pain from the next technique revived me and I continued to fight. Kimura went to his grave without ever knowing the fact that I was finished. If possible, I wish I could have talked about the fight with him and let him know about it. Kimura was strong, strong and a gentleman. He spoke in my ear in Japanese, good, good, while catching me with an arm lock. I don't understand Japanese at all, but strangely I was encouraged by his voice. It gave me power. I was anxious about it, so I asked him later. He said, I was admiring your heart. Same to him. I think I got the authentic samurai spirit from him. I might have been Japanese in my previous life. And that right there is a little quote from the great Alio Gracie, founder of Gracie Jiu Jitsu, which, in my opinion, what do they say? In my humble opinion? Sure. In my humble opinion, kind of makes him the founder of modern martial arts. You agree? Disagree? Modern, yep. No, at I would at least you have to, that's a consideration. Mm-hmm. Uh, what do they say when they say in the conversation, right? Yeah. In the conversation for chi- for the founding of modern mixed martial arts, Elio Gracie has to be in the conversation, 100%. And it's a quote from an interview that is quoted in a book, and the book is called Kimura, The Triumphs and Tragedy of Japan's Greatest and Most Controversial Judo Champion. This book was originally given to me recently by my friend and training partner, Miha. You know Miha? Of course. You know Miha. You train with Miha. Yes, sir. You, sometimes. I, yeah, sometimes. When from time to time. you arrive at the training the zone. Stuff. Yeah, it goes down for sure. Uh, so Miha, we went on a little trip lately, and he, he gave me this book to check out, and I thought, hmm, let's check it out. And Miha, he's, a, you know, obviously he's a jiu-jitsu black belt. He's also a judo black belt. But he thought I would like the book, so read the book. And this is a book, obviously, about Kimura. This is a... There's a submission hold also called Kimura. It's one of my favorites. I understand. <laughs> the, the, it's named, the, the, the submission hold has other names. People call it other things, but by now pretty much everyone calls it a Kimura and it's named after him. And that's the move that he put on Elio Gracie. And we'll get into that Elio Gracie match that they had. You know, Elio Gracie was a lot smaller and they had a good scrap, but he eventually had the towel thrown in so he didn't get his arm removed from his body by Kimura. But interesting life, incredible fighter, and I just wanted to uh, jump into this book. You got any background on Kimura over there? Um, just the same as, as you. Were. Just that right yeah, there? Yeah, he was, uh, he was already a super well-known guy in the martial arts world back in those days. Oh, yeah. But yeah, he was one of the, he's kind of the main catalyst for Elio Gracie from what I understand, mm-hmm. from what like, yeah, and going, and you said, you actually meant, you said um, the, one of the main, what do you say, found, Elio Gracie being yep. the founder of modern martial arts, mixed martial arts, I think so. Yep. Although they were doing Valley Tudo and stuff in, mm-hmm. in other ways or whatever, but yeah, how it c- kind of came to America and now what it is right now, MMA, mm-hmm. I would say he's, like if he's it the wasn't, guy. If it wasn't for... If it wasn't for Elio Gracie, Gracie Jiu Jitsu, yeah. you wouldn't quite have what we have. No. He's... And the evolution of martial arts in the last, I mean, we could say in the last six months, mm-hmm. but then you Even take the six. last 10 years, yeah. it's crazy. Yeah. But since 1993, since that first UFC, mm-hmm. the evolution has been incredible. 
the entire world of martial arts has changed. I mean, it used to be a totally different thing. Oh, yeah. In 1979, yeah. what martial arts were was a totally different thing than what it is now. Yeah, the main one. So back in... so. Gracie Jiu Jitsu te technically on record is, was founded in 1925. Maeda came over and taught the Gracie family what he called Jiu Jitsu, which was very close to Judo. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. And then you see, and so he became sort of the source because it kind of changed it, the source. And then the main vein was actually Horan Gracie, who he was the oldest son, where he brought it to America and was like, hey, we need to like show everybody. Mm -hmm. So he's the one who made the first UFC, mm -hmm. put Hoist in there. And, but they were all training, they were oh, all yeah. doing it, but it wasn't revealed to the world because of not, or it was later because of media, you see this big spectacle yeah. or whatever. And then slowly, it slowly started to spread through that main vein. And then in 2005, when Ultimate Fighter came out, yeah. that was when media really took it, turned it into a little reality show because that's when reality shows started getting their legs, you know? <laughs> yeah. So boom, they mix that up, boom. From there was just this massive, massive explosion. But it's crazy to think about like these guys back in the day, mm -hmm. they knew something that people just didn't know. Mm -hmm. They knew something that people did not know. And nowadays, look, you get into a street fight, there's a chance people know what the guard is. They might know how to slap a guillotine on. Mm -hmm. They might know, you know what the mount is. Like they're gonna know this stuff. Yeah. And if you go into any jujitsu school, like they're gonna know a lot of it. Man, back in the day, like when I when I got when I trained jujitsu for the first time with Master Chief Steve Bailey, sure. where yeah. there was no comprehension of what was happening, yeah. there was no comprehension at all. This did not. This was not a thing at all. There was no. There was not even like a thought of what was happening. Yep. It wasn't like the, the the idea that someone would take your arm and put it in a position where you would have to say uncle. Yeah. It didn't make sense, it wasn't a thing. Yeah, especially if the guy wasn't bigger than you. So it went from not being a thing at all to being the thing. Yeah. Think about that transition. Yeah. So these guys, and judo, you know, we, we've done some podcasts on judo, we've done some podcasts on Kano to talk about where that developed from, but judo, very powerful, very powerful martial art. And, and it is, you know, the roots of jujitsu. See, it's interesting because judo is rooted in jujitsu, but modern jujitsu is rooted in judo uh -huh. again. Back at it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, anyways, this guy, one of the greatest judokas ever. We're gonna roll into it. We're gonna look at his book here, and here we go. Kimura Masahiko was born on the southern island of Kyushu, and I'm, I apologize for the Japanese speakers out there. I don't speak Japanese at all, and I mangle all words. So, born September, 19, September 10th, 1917, little is known about his family background, although the family was said to be poor. According to one biography of Kimura, at the age of around 10, he began to help his father collect river gravel and stones to sell. They had to dig the gravel from the river bottom and deliver it to a nearby truck. On Sundays and holidays, when Kimura was out of school, he would work from 4 a.m. to 6 p.m. hauling gravel, an experience later credited with helping him build a strong body. You gotta have a little bit of mythology going on here. When you picture this 10-year-old kid hauling gravel out of the river, Mm -hmm. Cold river, got, having to go out. I mean, well, how deep is he going to get it? Is it knee deep or is he having to get a little breath hold activity <laughs> going on? And he's doing that from 4 a.m. to 6 p.m. That's what's happening. Uh, his uncle also encouraged the youngster to drink carp's blood, which is said to be good for the heart. So there you go. He's just ripping the heads off of fish and drinking their blood sure. while carrying rocks out of the river for 14 hours a day. You know, like mm -hmm. you're going to be ready for some jujitsu or some yes. judo competitions. Yeah, yeah. Japanese children were generally protected and not disciplined until they were about five. At that age, they began to face strict discipline, especially from their fathers. This often led young boys to act out with with a rebellious streak. And based on his later actions, Kimura almost certainly developed into a mischievous child when he entered school at the age of about six. By the time he was around nine or ten, Kimura was relatively large for his age and appears to have become something of a ringleader among the mischief makers in the school during his fourth grade year. Isn't it crazy? I mean, we're talking about a, a guy's fourth grade year. We got some deets, bro, some <laughs> details on this guy. The students were mustered 
to engage in Osoji, a thorough mass cleaning of the school. With his teacher, Mr. Tagawa absent, Kimura snuck away, dashing to a nearby snack shop and gobbling down five or six mantu, or steamed stuffed buns. Returning to his class, he saw several students moving Mr. Tagawa's desk. He ran toward the desk and jumped onto it, causing the desk to noisily collapse. Kimura jumped up and down with joy, screaming bonsai, bonsai. <laughs> And then he, this, there's quotes in here, and I looked for this book, that he has an autobiography out there somewhere. Or it's taken from interviews. I couldn't find either one of them. Miha looked for him as well. I couldn't find it. He says this. This is now Kimura talking. Suddenly, someone grabbed me firmly in the rear lapel and pulled me backward. When I turned my head, I found Mr. Tagawa, who I thought was absent, glaring at me with a very scary look. He yelled, idiot face, and slapped me in the face. He then threw me to the floor. He pulled me up, slapped me, and threw me to the floor again. After this, I was scolded in the teacher's room and stood in the corridor. After this incident, I decided to get even with Mr. Tagawa. I thought about how to get revenge on him for about a week and investigated his background. (laughs) I then found out that he was a first Don in Judo. I thought, is judo such a formidable art? Then I would be able to throw him if I became a second Don. Soon after this, I entered into the Shotokan Dojo nearby my elementary school. So he's got a little bit of a streak, right? Imagine (laughs) being 10 years old Mm. or whatever he is, fourth grade. What are you in fourth? Yeah, in fourth grade, you're 10 years old. Mm -hmm. So he's 10 years old. This teacher, he's actually being a jackass, mm-hmm. and the teacher slaps him around a little bit, mm-hmm. and he starts plotting revenge, researches it, does background yep. check, yep. figure out what's this dude deal, mm-hmm. where are his weaknesses, yep. finds out he's only a first Don in judo. <laughs> Once I become a second Don, <laughs> I'll be able to take him. Yep. All right, it goes on to say, Mr. Tagawa's corporal punishment and humiliation of the young Kimura was exactly what he needed. He began to practice judo and after only about a year, he entered his first competition, which they call Shiai, I think. A match with the Nakayama Dojo, which was located about three miles away. He faced a much bigger eighth grader. Kimura attempted a body drop throw and a major outer reaping throw to no effect, then attacked with the major inner reaping throw, but his opponent reversed the technique on him and pinned him to the ground with the top four corners hold for the win. Kimura continued to practice hard, driven on by the memory of his defeat. In eighth grade, he entered a prefectural sumo tournament and placed second. He narrowly missed the first place when he threw his opponent by a sotogari but the referee declared that his foot had been out of bounds. This success, and probably a growing reputation in judo circles, raised Kimura's visibility. A recruiter for Chinsei Junior High School visited his home and invited Kimura to attend the school and play either for the sumo or judo team. In 1932, Kimura entered Chinsei and became a fantastic, uh, a training fanatic. In addition to practicing at school, he trained at the Kawakita Dojo three times a week, at the Butokuden, and the Imperial Fifth High School. Altogether, he, rem- he later remembered he practiced judo five hours a day and did 300 push-ups daily. So we're getting into it. Mm-hmm. That, that idea of when people get introduced into being dominated, mm-hmm. physically dominated, can have, I guess it can have a bunch of outcomes, but the outcomes that we remember mm-hmm. are it either makes you say, whatever this is, I'm going to learn it so that I can never make sure this never happens to me. Or you can say, whatever this is, I hate it and I'm gonna avoid it at all costs so this never happens to me. Yeah. And I'm sure there's some gray area, but mm-hmm. especially I think 10 years ago when people didn't really understand what was happening, they didn't understand that it was a technique. Yeah. And if they figured out that it was a technique, they say, cool, I'm gonna learn these techniques. If they didn't understand it was a technique, they just ran away from it. Yeah. Sorcery. Who's the first person that put you to tap? Uh, probably my friend Jeremy, Jeremy Treskin. Oh, yeah. Jack. But it, keep in mind, this is, uh, you know, back, so 1993, UFC 1. And two, so this is 94 ish 
when you, you we bought the videotapes, mm. the Gracie, Wait, the, the Gracie in action. No, no, they weren't Gracie in action. They were the the instructionals. instructionals. Yeah, the VHS one. Do you remember Gracie in action? Yes, I do. Yeah, I still visit those yeah. very often because those are those have kind of look. They age well because you still get to see it, but. That's when you get to see what I was talking about earlier, just zero knowledge. Yeah. Like people that literally had no idea yeah. that the concept of a fight was to get the position and get someone to, sp- think about that. Yeah. That's a totally different concept. Yes. That's a totally different concept. It's, it, it's like a foreign concept that you could, that you might not understand at all. Yeah, and, and to prove, that's actually probably more true than that even sounds as far as you saying it. So, and this is why I know this. So the reason that I watch them a lot now is because I watch them with my son. Because mm-hmm. he don't know that. He, his idea of like, ooh, let's play fight, right? And he always wants to play fight. So what is it? He's kicking me, he's punching me and stuff like that. And he's like, let no, no. He's, so I'll like grab him and, and block his punches, whatever. And I'll put him in like a choke or whatever, mm-hmm. or put him in mount and be like, can't fight from here. Can you? He's like, no, 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 we're not doing jujitsu. We're fighting. That's what he's, he'd say. He thinks jujitsu is just fun, like a game. Mm-hmm. And then he'll think the real fighting is just a punching and kicking part. So I was like, Hey, you, what you don't understand is jujitsu is both the punching, kicking and the jujitsu. And I'm saying the jujitsu when faced with just the punching and kicking, if you don't put them together, like you'll lose to the jujitsu. He's like, whoa, what are you talking? You know, so I show him mm-hmm. the Gracie in action one. I was like, look, this is all fight. Watch this guy. He doesn't punch or kick or nothing. He just uses jujitsu. And these guys are really fighting. Look, they're really, really fighting. And he'd watch them and watch them and watch them. And then now he slowly understands all oh, and he sees and he understands now. But it's true. Cause yeah, when you see, oh yeah, two people got in a fight. Oh, it's always who knocked this guy out or kicked this guy's head or it's still, even when we watch on the movies. When they get in a fight, oh, it's all punching and mm-hmm. kicking, you know? So, like, our idea is a little bit skewed in that way, or it was anyway. You remember we talked on a couple of podcasts ago about the, Fo- I think it's the Fosbury flop, mm-hmm. the guy that jumped over the, uh, was the high jump? High jumped bar, yeah. over it high backwards. Jump. Yeah. And totally changed the game. Yep. Someone that was, look, they've been, they've been training that way for however many decades yeah. of jump over or split jump, whatever they were doing to get over it. Mm-hmm. This was a brand new thing mm-hmm. that people looked at and go, wait a second, what is this? Yeah, That's how different it was to say, oh, we're gonna get a hold of this opponent and we're gonna get a hold of their arm or we're gonna get a hold of their neck or we're gonna get a hold of their leg and we're gonna force them to tap out or we're gonna break it. People just didn't understand this. Yeah. <sighs> All right. Uh, 1932, at the age of 15, he entered his first promotional Shi'i testing for Shodan. That's for the first dawn. That's the first degree. In tournaments at that time, a candidate often stayed on the mat until he was defeated. Kimura beat five other high school students and earned his Shodan, so he got his first degree. The next year, his run-in with his elementary school teacher and his vow to achieve Naidan, apparently forgotten, he entered the promotional contest again, defeating all four members of the opposing team, all by Epon, and was promoted to Naidan, which is the second degree. So interesting in judo, if you don't know this, Epon is a way that you can immediately win a judo match by throwing your opponent where their feet leave the ground and any part of their body touches the ground before their feet. If you do that, you instantly win. We could discuss the what that really means, because unfortunately, okay, if you're on concrete and you throw someone on concrete, it's definitely gonna hurt them. It's gonna hurt them more than a mat is going to hurt them. So you could understand why people would say, well, you know, if I threw you like this, I would win. So therefore, if I throw you like this in a tournament, I will win. That being said, you can get thrown even on concrete and not be knocked out and not be injured badly. Mm. And that's where jujitsu comes into play. Because in jujitsu, you throw someone, the fight's far from over. Doesn't matter how you throw them. You have to submit them. You have to get body control. You have to really, really dominate and submit them in order to win. So the Ippon, again, there are certain Ippon throws that have happened on concrete, like you're you're not getting up, <laughs> for sure. Jam, yeah. But there's also Ippon throws that wouldn't knock you out, wouldn't wouldn't knock you out, wouldn't disable you from continuing to fight. Mm. But those are the rules. That's one of the problems with the rules 
in fighting. As soon as you put rules in fighting, things change. Mm-hmm. Any rule, things change. Sometimes they don't really matter. Sometimes they do. Really, sometimes they do matter. You know, one is uh, like, for instance, in MMA and in Jiu Jitsu, there's there's a rule that says no small joint manipulation. Yeah. All that means is I'm not allowed to grab one of your fingers mm-hmm. and bend it and break it. So, let's say I'm trying to choke you, and you and you're not allowed in a jujitsu tournament to grab my finger and break it. Mm-hmm. You're not allowed to do that. Here's why I actually think this is a legit rule. Because if you and I were in a real fight, mm-hmm. and I I had your back and I was trying to choke you, and you grabbed my finger to try and break it, guess what I would do? Probably be, get angry. Probably I would just let you break my finger as I choke you, and then I'd kill you. Yeah. Yeah. So. It's not a game changer, but it prevents injuries. Mm-hmm. So rules like that usually make sense. Now look, there's gonna be someone that says, yeah, but if I broke your finger, you might freak out. It's true, mm-hmm. true. Life or death battle though? No. Not happening. Mm-hmm. I, you know, even happens if, if, you know, if you and I are training and I get a heel hook on you. And since we're just training, I don't really crank it. And so then you get out. And I might say, well, you know, I, I didn't go hard because we weren't in competition. Well, guess what? You also, if we were in competition, you might not top that. You might just let the sprain happen. <laughs> so it's actually, it kind of cancels itself out a little bit. I'm not cranking as hard as I could. You're also not avoiding tapping at all or, or you know, just not going to tap, yeah. which is a different thing. So yeah. they're, they're all totally useful, though, in my opinion. I think that all, you know, there's a sportsmanship element to, to, all sports obviously mm-hmm. and jujitsu is that those are just some of them where look because in a jujitsu tournament if there was small joint manipulation you get guys who aren't right jujitsu tournament and it's not life and death so mm-hmm. technically that finger breaking that finger or whatever might work because it's not it's not life or death is this guy broke my finger i'm not yeah, going to yeah. compete with a broken finger yeah. you know it's not that serious to me yeah now i can't you know, do my job for yeah. the next four weeks while yeah. I let my finger heal up. Or like my, or my homework. Stupid. Yeah, or or nothing, my homework yeah or or nothing in real life or whatever. So it's kind of like, all right, let's make that a rule because it's going to vary from person to person, mm-hmm. you know? And meanwhile, hey, if you get a hold of a finger and it's not that serious to somebody, it's like kind of effective, you know? It's like, because it hurts and you get someone who's not thinking life or death, boom, they're going to stop and be like, hey, my finger's working, whatever. So let's make that a rule. Let's keep it sportsman-like, you know? Mm-hmm. The heel hook thing is kind of the same thing, just to like one level lower, like in practice, right? Where, and this goes for any submission really, except for chokes, because chokes, you can just choke the guy out and it's no harm, no foul. But like if you get a Kimura or something like that, something where like the more flexible the guy is, the more he'll probably be able to resist it kind of a thing. Mm -hmm. And you're bending this guy's thing or heel hook or whatever. If this guy you're training with thinks it's like life or death, he's going to kind of jam himself up. Yeah. But it's up to him. He can either tap or whatever, or or he can be like, yeah, and get out or whatever. It's still just training. It's not that serious, you know? Mm-hmm. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a rule. So you kind of got that going on. I think that kind of goes for most sports too, you know? But you do have to be careful because there are rules of like, for instance, in MMA, you're not allowed to kick a downed opponent in the head, Yeah. right? So that means some of these positions are changed. They're like back in the day in pride, you could kick in the head and you could knee in the head. I remember I used to spar with Dean when he's getting ready for pride. Mm -hmm. And like if I shot on him and sprawled, he'd knee me in the head 17 times. (laughs) Like legit. Teach you. Yeah. He, and it's, it's not, it's not a good thing. Yeah. Whereas in the UFC, you're not allowed to do that. So that means you can shoot, you can get sprawled on and the person has to adjust their attack and it makes you. It makes shooting a much more comfortable thing because you think, oh, I'll just, you know, whatever, I'll get back to the top or I'll get back up to my feet. Mm -hmm. If you know that every time you shoot and get sprawled on, you're going to get kneed in the head nine times, Mm -hmm. that's a problem. They have the thing with that, quote, downed opponents. So if you and I are fighting and you're in a position where you could knee me, but I put my hand on the ground, like up against the cage, this happens a lot. I put my hand on the ground. Now I'm a, quote, downed opponent. Now you're not allowed to kick or knee me in the head. Yeah. Well, that's kind of right. The rules yeah. are starting to affect the, the the way a fight would go. Yeah, what do they call it? Gaming it. Yeah, you start game gaming the system. Bit. That's part of it. And that's one of the things that happens with judo. Another thing in judo is you can pin someone. Oh, yeah. You know, so you if you hold someone down, that you can win the match that way. In jiu-jitsu, you can't win by pinning. Mm-hmm. Look, it sucks 
being on the bottom when someone's holding you down, yep. but you don't, that, that person on top either has to hold you there until it's over, and hopefully they're up on points, or they have to try and submit you. But they can't finish the fight just by holding someone. Mm. So there are rules that affect and remove some of the realism from some martial arts. Mm -hmm. You know, some of the point fighting uh, striking arts mm -hmm. where you're, you're throwing strikes, but you're actually not allowed to, there's some where you're not allowed to strike in the head. Mm -hmm. So you see guys come out and they have their hands down because they're just trying to deal with body blows, mm -hmm. which totally messes up they're fighting for real. So they have to be careful with rules. Nonetheless, an Ippon in, ju in judo, you win. Hmm. All right, going back to the book. The following year, May of 1934, he traveled to Kyoto for the first time in his life to test for his third degree. He was required to take a written exam and skill test as well as compete. After passing the skill test, he admits in his autobiography, which again, I tried to find, to being clueless about the written exam, so he turned around and snatched the finished exam from the boy behind him and turned it in. <laughs> Obviously, the increasingly serious Kimura still had some mischievous boy inside in the contest. At only age 16, he was awarded the rank of third degree. He moved up one degree for each of his three consecutive years. Next year, as a 10th grader, about age 15 to 16, Kimura fought in the Saga Prefectural Budokuden red-white team match. Amazingly, uh, with only about a year's time in grade, he threw four of the other third degrees and, and other opponents, including the captain of the opposing team, 10 for 10. He was awarded the rank of Yodan, which is fourth degree at the age of 16, after only six years of training. He was named captain of the Chinsei High School team as a junior, an honor usually reserved for a senior. So he's a badass. And not to mention he's training five hours a day. I mean, bro, when you're training five hours a day, you're not doing anything in school but just training. Mm -hmm. you're, now look, there is a distinction between people that train hard, people that are naturally gifted, and then there's a third group, which is people that are naturally gifted and they train hard. Mm. If you're in that third group, you're a rare, you're a rare human. Because mm. a lot of times people that are naturally gifted, they get away, they don't even learn how to train hard. They don't yeah. even know how to train hard because they're just so naturally gifted. Mm. You get other people that are, that, that they, they don't have the gift, so they have to train hard, mm. so they learn to train hard. And both those groups actually can become champions. Mm. But if you want to become a, a goat, yeah, yeah, the goat. Oh, if you want to be a goat, you got to be in that third. You got to be George St. Pierre, naturally gifted and trained like a freaking maniac. Yeah. Right? That's what that's what you become in those situations. So my my suspicion is that Kimura had natural talent and trained like crazy. Mm. This is what you end up with. Yeah. A guy that's just murdering people when he's 16 years old. Yeah. Uh, a fourth Don High School student was extremely rare, and Kimura began to attract national attention. In his senior year, Kimura competed in the National Junior High School Tournament in Kyoto. His team advanced to the finals, and he had and he had to face a very tough team from Kyoto First Commercial Junior High School, a team known for its strong groundwork, Nawaza. That's the other thing you got to remember is, I mean, the stuff that's going on in, in high school you know, judo is the sport in Japan, mm. especially in this time. It's kind of, you know, when I talk to people from around the country and people will ask me, well, people used to say like, oh, your son's in high school or your daughter's, or your, what sports do they play? And you know, I would say wrestling. And then for my son, I'd be like, oh my, he's on the surf team. And people are like, what, you know, what are you talking about? Like, oh no, they have a, I would just, yeah, he's on the surf team at his high school. What do you mean? Well, they have a surf team. They compete against other high schools. They have a California state champion. Like, yep. that's the way it goes. <laughs> Judo is like that in Japan, especially at this time. Mm. This was the sport. This is what they're doing. Oh, yeah. You know what's another cool thing? Have you, have you ever been to Thailand? No, never. In Thailand, Muay Thai, it's like the national sport. Mm. And if you go to America and you flew around a town in a helicopter, all the tennis courts, all the basketball courts, 
all the baseball diamonds, all the soccer fields, all those things, all those different sports mm. in Thailand, the way I remember it, there's only one thing. Mm. There's just Muay Thai. <laughs> so you'd be walking down the street, you see like little kids just throwing Muay Thai kicks at each other. Yeah. You'd see kids kicking bags, like hanging in. Instead of having, you know, if you drive that through a neighborhood in San Diego, mm. how many basketball hoops do you see in the neighborhood? Yeah, yeah you see, you know, you well, see yeah. 25 houses, you see seven or eight basketball hoops in, well. the, in the driveway. Mm. In Thailand, there's just heavy bag. Yeah, you, there's that many heavy bags. There's no nothing else. That's pretty legit. Yeah, it's legit. Yeah. So and I seen you can see videos online of you know this guy where I remember Stuart Cooper, Stuart mm-hmm. Cooper films. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right? yeah, he lived yeah, yeah. in Thailand for a while, and you know you can watch cool videos or whatever. And yeah, when you see the yeah they're out on the streets the same way, and that's such a good yeah, yeah. comparison. Where if you take football, basketball, baseball, <laughs> and actually soccer, and you put those all together in the U.S., it's just, it's just winter. Winter. yeah, because like. It's like the old thing where, you know, um, you know, you see kids just playing basketball with a basket, yep. you know, pinned up um, or, you know, guys just randomly playing soccer in a place where you don't really play soccer mm-hmm. in the driveway or in the cul-de-sac or something mm-hmm. like that. In fact, go down neighborhoods, you'll see the basketball thing, basketball basket yep. in the cul-de-sac. You yep. know? So yeah, it's yeah, kind of for, for sure. everyone kind yeah, of yeah. a thing. It's like just kind of we can pick up here and pick yep. up there, whatever, whatever. It's the same exact thing, but it's the kids randomly hanging out at the park. Two guys doing Muay Thai over yep. here, you know, just yeah, there's two guys doing Muay Thai over there. There's a kid kicking a freaking palm tree over there. Yeah, you know, you know? it's and, crazy. And that's what judo was at this time for Japan. Yeah. It was like, that's what we're doing. Yeah. We're doing judo. Mm-hmm. So him being a champion, it's kind of like being a surfing champion in high school in California. You're you're competing. Did they have surf teams in Hawaii? Yeah. Were you on it? No, not not for high school. No. no. Was no. I on it? No. I was not <laughs> <on a surf laughs> team. no. No, not in high school. In fact, now I'm thinking of it. They're like clubs. They're not for like high school. What you're talking about? No. Yeah, they have a scholastic surf program, mm. and you compete. Yeah. Well, if they do have it in Hawaii, I don't know about it. It's like in the mountains, they have ski teams at high schools. Mm -hmm. You know, like that's just what they're doing. What about snowboarding? Probably. Probably. But, you know, I can't speak for the snowboarding. I don't know it as well. But in New England growing up, like some kids that went to school in Vermont or New Hampshire, they had little ski teams. That's dope. So that's really, really good, for lack of a better word, indoctrination. But the judo, the whole, that's why we've covered the judo books on here. I forget the number of the podcast, but. You know, there's a whole, judo is just not a sport. It's a whole way of being. Mm -hmm. It's a whole way of acting. Mm -hmm. And that's what they were trying to inculcate the people with was sort of a a warrior spirit that was centered around this martial art, judo. Mm -hmm. So this guy, Kimura, just being as good as he is, that's saying a lot. Um... Fast forward, he does another contest. There's a bunch of results of contests in here. One time he had a triple victory, and his school, for the first time, became the national champions. He talks about some of those fights here, which is interesting to hear. He says, I had two big fights during my Chinsei junior high days. In those days, Budo was widely and feverishly practiced. Given this background, it was a natural consequence that a young man who rapidly became famous became a target of challenge. The first fight occurred when I was in the second year. One member of Chinsei Junior High Judo Club, whose name was Ida, who competed for the position of second year student captain with me and lost, developed a hatred toward me. On a Saturday of June on my way to the school dojo, he walked up to me and said, I have a little business with you, so come with me. In a case like this, the meaning of business is tactically understood. He uttered, you are impudent. I am going to get you today. And took out a jackknife from his pocket and suddenly thrust it at my abdominal area. I thought I evaded it successfully, but the knife got into my buttock. He got on a bicycle and started to run away. I also ran after him while bleeding from the buttock and finally got to his house. He stayed inside the house and did not come out. Instead, his parents came out and apologized to me thoroughly and sincerely. They said our son cut his own hand when he stabbed you. He is in his bed now with doctors on the way. It turned out that Ida's injury was more serious than mine, but I had to stay away from practice for about 20 days. So he got cut up. Dude, back in the day. Just like that. The judo <laughs> players weren't playing. <laughs> no, they were not. In my third year at school, I was challenged by K. 
the name of the student is kept secret in the book, who was then considered to be the number one street fighter among all the junior high school students in the area. He was a student of Kuma Kumamoto Commerce Junior High. He was small in stature, but was known to pull out a knife in every street fight. It was known that when he loses, his parents and relatives all join him and ambush for revenge. <laughs> On my way back, I was about to cross the bridge. He found me and said, hold it right there, come with me. We walked to a park near Sunset. He said, you are Kamira, aren't you? This was the first time that we saw each other face to face. We glared at each other over a distance of about one meter. Then suddenly he pulled out a Tonto, which is a freaking short sword, and thrust it forward at me. I evaded it, grabbed him, and threw him hard onto the ground. Now, in this state, he is no match to me. I am K, I surrender, you are strong. He honestly revealed his identity and apologized. After this, none of his parents came to see me. Moreover, no junior high school student challenged me for a street fight. Yeah, dude, when you get a sword pulled on you and you just jack the dude, you're not worried about getting picked on anymore. In the fall of 1934, um, he's now going to university, university, Takushoko, Takushoku, again, I apologize to my Japanese people out there for mutilating your language. Um, he's going to college now, Kamira defeated eight consecutive opponents, lost his ninth match. Although Kimura smoked, as did many Japanese men, he reported he was an excellent long distance runner. During his college years, Kamira said, In a 1987 interview, he trained 10 and a half hours a day. He would begin by striking the makiwara, which is like a striking post, the thing that you punch. You seen those things? The one with the rope around it? Yeah, I think it's the one with the rope around it. Mm -hmm. 1,000 times with each fist, a training method he had learned from studying karate. Then he would head off to the police department dojo where he would work out with other tough judoka for about an hour. A three-hour training session at Takudai, Followed then from 6:30 to about 7:30 p.m. He would train at the Kodakon followed by a three-hour session at a local judo dojo near the campus But that was not the end of his day after I went home and ate I would I would take a bath and then do solo training first a thousand push-ups then bodybuilding 600 bench presses with 80 kg It's 175 pounds roughly barbells Just that would take about an hour so he's going. That's a savage workout. Yes, it is. I, 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 I'm thinking about doing that. Okay. I'm thinking about getting into like, dude, 600 reps. That's crazy. That actually kind of sounds like your kind of workout. You it, know, how like you, you're, you. I don't know. You told me this a couple times, a few times, where you, uh, I was like, oh, what was the workout? You'd be like, oh yeah, pull ups today. And I was like, bro, what does that mean? <laughs> like mine is like four sets of five or five <laughs> sets of twelve. You're like, yeah, pull ups today. How many doing like, I don't know, thousands of pull-ups, but it's like over time, yeah, right? Yeah. Like you just see how, and that's what that sounds like, where yeah. it's like, yeah, 80, 80 kilograms, I'm going to do 600. I mean, I'll be honest with you, I don't like benching because I, I don't like the way it feels on my shoulder. Mm-hmm. So maybe I'll have to figure out, maybe there's a dumbbell equivalent or something. Well, I don't know. Maybe, hell yeah, dumbbells all day. So benching, <laughs> <laughs> bench is a good one. I feel, I feel like, I don't know for sure, but I feel like Arnold kind of was like one of the main like proponents of bench. So it kind of got like a thing. But then again, I know there was like bench before. There was a guy when I got to the team hell yeah. and he was an older dude, you know? Mm-hmm. Which means he was probably a little bit younger than me right now, but he seemed a little old at the time. Mm. But he was he worked in the paraloft, which is where they did pack parachutes and stuff. Yeah. And I think he was kind of, you know, finishing up his uh finishing up his career. But he would allegedly he would just like pack a parachute. Like do do like let's say it takes twenty minutes to pack a parachute. Mm. He'd pack a parachute for five minutes, get like to a certain f- step, and then just go jack steel for 15 minutes or 10 minutes and come back and do a little bit more and do, he yeah. would just basically lift all day long Yeah, that's, jam. that's the kind of thing where I think that'd be real good for you. Well, yeah, I mean I all this So I learned this Phrase when I was kind of getting certified to be a personal trainer yeah. back in the day Dude, I kind of forgot about that whole yeah. thing. time under tension no, um, it, you've, you've quoted that one to me before. Yeah, and that one goes deep, by the way. So some people they think like, oh, let's just put a lot of tension on there, or sorry, a lot of time under tension, mm-hmm. but that's pretty low tension if the time is going to be. Anyway, no, it's not that. It's um, it was 
in regards to, you know, in the in, there's a, I don't know, you don't go to public gyms. So in public gyms, this is a thing. I've been to public gyms. Yeah. So well, in okay. My life, uh, okay. Believe it or not. There you go. But you'll be less familiar with this um, this event, mm-hmm. this occurrence, where someone will see someone doing something quote unquote wrong, mm-hmm. right? And then they'll go and they'll correct them, correct them, or give them tips or whatever. Unwanted advice. Advice, exactly. Unsolicited right. advice. Unsolicited. So you know, some guys they do it to girls to maybe just get an in to talk to them or whatever. There's many different reasons for it, mm-hmm. but the main one of the main like problems that would come from that sometimes is like when you ask someone like, hey, or when you tell someone, hey, no, you're doing it wrong. Here's the right way to do it. No matter how nice you say it, the thing you're missing is what are they training for. Mm-hmm. So really, one of the things you have to understand is you have to know what the person is training for to be able to determine if they're doing it right or wrong. Mm-hmm. For the most part, there are exceptions, but are you speaking, training to blow out your back? <laughs> <laughs> hey man, like I said, like so, and there are so many times where even as a professional trainer for decades or whatever, you find out what they're training for, and you're like, oh, wait a minute, that makes a lot more sense. Mm-hmm. I don't know about that kind of training. That's like some fitness routine and mm-hmm. or or competition or whatever you're doing is that I'm unfamiliar with, and you have to admit that, obviously. So you can be surprised with that stuff where you're thinking that violates every rule that I've ever learned ever in a certification course or outside of a certification course that violates it, you go find out what they're training for. And you're like, I never heard of that. So I, I have nothing to input on your training, you know? Anyway, um, so you gotta, like I said, back to the point, you gotta find out what they're training for. So mm-hmm. you know how you say, you just said, that sounds like it'd be good for you. Yeah. yeah, Maybe. Yeah, I mean, if you're gonna be getting in 40 minute judo matches and you can bench press, that takes you an hour. I mean, if he said that took about an hour, mm. Dude, that's a lot. That's 10 reps a minute yeah. for an hour. Yeah, so there's... um. That's a freaking tough workout, man. So the... Because there's certain physiological and biological like things that go on in your body if you train certain ways, mm-hmm. you know? So... Um, and oh, the Bulgarian, if you look into the Bulgarian oh, freaking yeah. training, oh, rabbit, yeah. it's crazy. So they, they do stuff like um, they just max out. It'd be like an eight-hour training sesh all max out, but they'd max out like at a certain time, you know? So the reps, the volume would be like kind of small, Mm -hmm. but the intensity would be just the highest, highest. Doubles and singles. Oh yeah. And there's all kinds of ways to do that. Um, So it depends, like I said, depends on what you're training for, depends on the approach, because there are many ways to get that to that goal, depends on the person, depends on like what kind of training. Regardless of everything that you're saying right now. (laughs) Sir, yeah. Let's face it, if you can bench press 185 pounds, 600 times yeah, in, in an t- hour? <laughs> Let's face it, regardless good, of whatever you're saying, you're in pretty good shape. That's a good training that's session. That's a good training session. So, so, and then, but then, but think about this. And, not, you know, and I'm not just being a contrarian at all, but it's something to think about mm-hmm. where bench, dumbbell press, whatever, that's usually for like powerlifting or bodybuilding, right? So if you're training for like to be able to endure some, punishment and still have your muscles and joints function so that's why you're doing that training i could see it for sure but it goes about it goes beyond like bodybuilding because oh, he said bodybuilding for sure but it goes it's not the maybe best he, way to maybe do he means bodybuilding not in the way that yeah. you're thinking yeah, he doesn't yeah. mean bodybuilding like i'm gonna be on the cover of a magazine yeah. he means i'm building my body for war yeah i think you're correct about that <laughs> yeah. uh he then goes, going back to the book, this is his, him talking about his training routine. Then Uchikomi, which is practicing throwing without a partner, against a maple tree a thousand times. I would wrap a judo belt around a very thick ma- maple tree, but doing that a thousand times a day, the trees would snap rather quickly. It was really expensive. Then I would take out a rope and do the Osotogari training. So this guy is training like a madman. Kamira told the same interview that he slept only about two hours a night, feeling that sleep was a waste of time. <laughs> no wonder he trained, no wonder he gained a reputation as the training ogre <laughs> or training demon. <laughs> so, uh, he ended up having some losses. Um, one time a guy named Osawa Kenichiro threw Kamira head first onto the mat, gave him a concussion. Despite his concussion, he fought another match, this time against Abe Kenshiro. Abe was another judo prodigy, uh, youngest ever in some 
of his advancements and, and he lost he, or he also beat Kimura had another loss by Yamamoto Hideo so he had some losses and of course it says this in the book Kimura was extremely upset, upset by the unusual experience of losing and reportedly considered quitting judo for a time. Oh, that's mm. that day when you go to the jujitsu mats and you think, <laughs> man, this isn't for me. That's actually a, that's actually a, a overused joke of mine. Yeah. You know, like if I have a rough day on the mat, I'm like, man, I walked out of here yesterday. Yeah. I, was, I was thinking maybe I just need to give up jujitsu. You <laughs> yeah. know, that's what I was thinking. Yeah. Yeah, but that's how though, right? Remember like how you, did you have a word for, I think you might be talking about something else, but got the guys in the teams who are there like so good at stump something and they've never lost and they don't really lose. So when oh, they lose, yeah, it devastates yeah. them way worse than the average going, guy. This isn't the SEAL team. This is going through buds. Yeah. yeah like yeah, a yeah. guy going through buds who's a gazelle. Gazelle, gazelle, gazelle. Meaning they yeah. always win. They won everything their whole life. They're ne- never lost anything. And then they just, yeah. They it's lose. devastating. Yeah. They can't handle it. Can't handle the fresh. Uh oh. So is that, you, you feel like there was some gazelle like. Uh, qualities in that scenario for um, for Kimura? Nope, I don't think so. I think that he had won a bunch. Yeah, May, okay, a little bit. That yes. was like a Jocko kind yeah, of tendency. That was like a little like. What were you saying about squats? Where you're like, <laughs> I think it's what the twenty rep squats. Yeah, twenty rep. I don't even want to be strong. I don't, I don't yeah, know if I want to be strong. Worth it. This yep, isn't worth it. it. <laughs> I'd rather just be weak. Just get me out of here. Just because like the twenty rep squats are, God, squats are so daunting. You're like on, questioning your whole. Uh, Strength existence. Those, those 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 squats when you do those twenty rep squats for real when you do them for real they're 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 a a journey a mental journey. You know how we've had people on the podcast talking about their uh, psychedelic journeys with yeah. like ayahuasca and all this stuff and they're screaming and crying and like their insides <laughs> are burning and all this stuff. <laughs> if you do twenty rep squats correctly, yeah. same thing, bro. Uh, do same you, thing. Do you just do one giant set or or one like hard set or is it like like two, three, so how many sets do you do the, over the 20 sets? When I was really into that, yeah. I, I, I have this where it's actually in the book, Discipline Equals Freedom, mm. Field mm. Manual. <laughs> I I haven't done this in a long time, and I would need to like ch- change my lifestyle a little bit again and get back in the game mm-hmm. on that particular game. Yeah. So I used to do warm up, and then I would do 20 rep squat, 20 minute break, 20 minute squat or 20 rep squat, 20 minute break, 20 rep squat. So we'd take one hour yeah, and it would be 20 sets. minutes of recovery. <laughs> it was horrible. It was so, I would, by the time I got done, like I would take, you know, get done, go for a jog to try and move some of the lactic acid. And by the time I got done, I would be thinking like, I have to do this again in a, in whatever it is, five days. And I'd be like upset about it yeah, and not one. I'd be mean. thinking maybe I should get into crochet. You know, maybe I should get into <laughs> like some other thing. What's funny about that, I can relate 100% by the way, but what's funny about that, especially when you're like freaking like, you're so mad that you have to do it. Yeah. You know, it's your workout. You made it up. Yeah, you yeah. don't have to do anything, you know, but it's like, you're so like connected to the workout. Mm-hmm. It's like 20 rep squats. If you only got 19 reps, like you'll probably be mentally kind of jammed up for a little bit. Oh yeah, where bro, I have that too. That's weird. The and it, this is fresh in my mind about the twenty rep squat. So I've never done the twenty rep squat. It's mm-hmm. like that. I've done twenty yeah, reps yeah, of yeah, squat yeah. before. You haven't of course, done it with a weight that you can only do ten. Yeah, times. like as the workout. I've done fifteen and actually did fifteen today. But here's the thing: it's not. It's different. Mm-hmm. So I did my regular squat routine and then I just put a light weight on there and I did fifteen. But this was at the end and I, I try to keep my rest to kind of a minimum. So I'm like mm-hmm. kind of like jammed up. Mm-hmm. So I was like, let me, let me bust out 15 real quick. My legs yeah. are burning right now. Yeah. They're weaker. You know how you're like weaker. And I went and my usual higher rep is 12. That's my usual higher rep day. So once I hit the 12, I could just feel my body just like strength oh. just drop off it at it 13. Done. Yeah. Like almost like physiologically, it thought it was done. Mm-hmm. Like for real. So at 13, it was like, boom, almost like the thing got so heavy all of a sudden. Then I did 14. And then like the 15th, it was kind of that, like how you said that, almost like an outer body experience. <laughs> kind of like, hey, your legs kind of don't really work anymore. Look, it was lighter weight, so I get it, but I could feel the little hints of this where mm-hmm. like your legs don't work anymore. Like, hey, like your legs are saying, hey, we're not supposed to be doing this. And they check out. So you're just like using your whole m- brain yep. to get like the rep or whatever. I'm like, dang, what if I had to do 20 of those things? Mm-hmm. Even with that weight right there, bro, I think, 
I think that might take me off to a distant land. Man. Yeah, yeah. You gotta get it. used to that. You do. Yeah. You do. I saw freaking uh, uh, Josh Hanger, right? You know who that is, right? Josh Hanger. He's uh, he trains at Autos. He was oh, Keenan's yeah, yeah. guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So he, it was like just a video clip that he posted or whatever. He was like, oh yeah, I'm, um, finishing out the my leg workout with a, a set of twenty, and it was two wheels, two twenty five. And he did all 20. I was like, bro. And he's smaller than me. Mm-hmm. I was like, bro, you got me beat by a lot, Wayne. <laughs> that is some shit. Uh, so that being said, we're talking about this quitter's mindset that can come in. And it came to Kimura. Mm-hmm. And he, th- he lost a few times, lost four times. And he says, maybe I should just quit. But then going back to the book, his competitive personality and the encouragement of several friends led him to rededicate himself. He's f- to train even harder. At the university, he trained to increase his strength by carrying around a 132 pound bag of sand. <laughs> he said, I thought practicing twice as much as others would be sufficient since I heard others were practicing about three hours a day. In reality, however, they had been practicing f- about four hours a day, which I found out later. He gets revenge. There's a section called Revenge. Osawa Kenshiniro, Okenishiro, one of those who had defeated Kimura in competition, regularly trained at the Kyushu Police Dojo, and Kimura exacted his revenge on Osawa there, throwing him for Ippon. Abe Kenshiro was more difficult to catch up with because their paths seldom crossed, but Kimura caught wind of the fact that Abe was going to be training at the Kodokan on a certain day and showed up to challenge him. The 500 mat dojo was silent except for the two judoka. During the 20 minute practice, Abe was thrown many times. Kimura threw Abe to the hardwood floor, presumably off the edge of the mat, 11 times and six times to the tatami. Disgusted, Abe eventually quit. At the time, Kimura was still a college student while Abe had graduated and was a professional instructor. So he got his little vengeance. Those were in the training hall. Mm -hmm. But it sounds like if you're in the training hall and everyone stops and watches you, you know what I mean? (laughs) Like it's one thing like, oh, let's say you and I had, you know, you'd beat me in a tournament. Yeah. And then I went to your academy and I beat you mm-hmm. or you came to my or whatever. We met at a neutral academy just in a training session, like an open mat. Mm-hmm. And then I beat you. I wouldn't feel like I really got my vengeance. Yeah. But if everybody stopped and they were watching and then I yeah. threw you 11 times onto the hardwood. Yeah. I'd be like, yeah, you know what's up now. Yeah. There's a little bit of revenge. Oh, Let's yeah, say. and especially, and that's a good point, too, when everyone stops and watches, right, where, I mean, there's a, there's a few subtle elements that are sometimes, most of the time, like, they're intangible, only the two people that are competing or practicing mm-hmm. feel it, mm-hmm. where, you know, how, like, when things escalate and you feel the sense of training start to diminish and the sense of competition really take over, you know, like, we all had that before, come yeah, on. Yeah, yeah. So with a scenario like this, where it's like, hey, he beat me in the tournament, and then you start feeling that bubble up, and then people start watching, that's when you know. That's like 100%. Like, hey, this is no longer training. This is, It's on. This is the rematch going on right now. I feel Dang. like that's the case. Okay. You don't feel that way? No, I think you're right. I think when you have a bunch of, when you have a 500 mat, that's a huge dojo. It's a Kodakon, man. That's a yeah. massive place. And everyone's watching. Yep. You feel that escalation. Yeah. You're getting smashed like yeah. however many times in a row. Bro. Imagine being that much of a champion like Abe was and somebody comes and just beats you whatever, 17 times, that's humiliation. Yeah, that's rough, that's real rough. <clears throat> In the fall of 1937, Kimura repeated his victory as all Japan collegiate champion in the biannual tournament, winning six matches. Three with a Sotogari, one with a Pan, one with his increasingly famous arm lock and won by pin. As a result of this win, Kimura became the first student permitted to enter the All Japan Judo Championship held October 23rd and 24th, 1937. In the finals, he goes against a guy, Nakajima Mazayuki, who's a fifth Don. He got these, There's a really good, and hey, I'm just reading little excerpts of this book. Obviously get the book, get the book, Christopher M. Clark. I don't think I mentioned his uh, name yet, but that's the book. It's Christopher M. Clark who wrote the book. Get the book. It's on Amazon. 
uh, I'm only reading some highlights from it. So if you want the details, get it. But he goes into a pretty good description of how he, of, of this competition. But uh, let me let me take you through what he says. He says, after... After the 30-minute battle, both my skin and gi were soaked with sweat. Sweat was dripping in so much quantity that I could hardly open my eyes. I had to open my eyes alternately to see. Before the next overtime, I and Nakajima sat to bring our gi to the proper position. I tried to untie the belt, but I could not generate enough force in my hands to do so. The knot felt as hard as a stone. My fingers were almost completely powerless so that it took me a long time to fix the gi. Then I saw Nakajima extend his legs, alternately rub his calves with his hands. I thought those legs are the key for my victory. I retightened my black belt and watched his motion carefully. As soon as the judge announced start, I tackled at his legs. He fell on his buttocks. I then caught him thinking I could never win if I lost this chance and frantically held him pinned. The intense battle, which lasted 40 minutes, finally ended. So... That's kind of crazy. Um, there's another in preparing for that match, and I and I read an interview with him as well. But he has like a basically it, it's it's a near death experience that he has. It says this in the book: Kamira constantly pushed himself to find his limits. In 1936, while training for the national championships, he had what he called a mysterious experience in which I truly discarded my life. <laughs> so he goes to this um, other dojo, and they actually had an actually Miha and I were talking about this. Miha pointed out that they have something called de dekego, which is practice outside one's regular dojo, which is really smart. It's really smart not just to only tra- look. It's good to have. It's great to have a great school that you train at, but it's also good to go and try other go to other gyms. And in, in, in this is for anything, you know, in, in the SEAL teams, like when I ran training, we had Rangers that came and worked with us. We had special forces guys that came. Hey, how do you guys do it? We would send guys to their schools. Mm-hmm. Why? Because we want to practice outside of our own dojo. Mm-hmm. We want to get the other look. Yeah. You know, that's kind of a term that gets used these days. Sure. Get another look. Yeah. So that's actually how I met Miha because Miha was coming. You know, some of the guys from Legion come down here, you know, like let's mix it up. You know, the, the, on a open mat day at Victory, there's people from every, basically every academy in Southern California, really. Mm. So that's a good plan. So that's what Kimura does in this particular instance. And he says, I went to train and there were about 82 students there, all of whom who, were un, under, who had been undergoing strenuous training. They were strong back then. We were, we're talking about an instructor's college. I said, and he asked, uh, a polite way of asking the trainees to engage in practice. I'm not going to try and use the Japanese because they have it in here. And stepped down to the dojo. So he basically says, hey, who wants to train? And he says it in a friendly way. Mm-hmm. And he stepped in for a, a type of training that's called continuous attack practice. <laughs> Which to me kind of sounds like what we might call a shark tank, son. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> he says, I had won the student championship. So when I threw one of them, the next would charge at me and I'd try to hang on and go all out to throw him. I thought that even if I went to my knees, I would get the ippon. I'd do about five minutes with one person for around 70 people. At some point, I began to feel faint, and when I braced myself against it, I lost consciousness and fell forward. However, my body was moving. Even though I lost consciousness, the offense and defensive techniques kept on fighting for me. I don't know where I went then, When I looked, about 15 students of the instructor's college were gathered together looking at something in one corner of the dojo. I wondered what they were doing while I was training. And when I glanced over, I saw somebody stretched out on the floor. When I looked down from above, I said, hey, isn't that me? When I looked at my face stretched out on the floor, it looked calm and peaceful. 
I was smiling as I slept. I felt that this was a really good way to sleep. So strenuous was the practice that even Kimura felt he was dying. Heart beating so fast he thought his heart was going to explode. However, he held on and gradually regained his strength and mental power back. Through this experience, he realized that no matter how exhausted he would eventually regain his power back, this belief was one of the reasons for Kimura's unbelievable victories. Taking it to the limit, as we like to say. Crazy. Have an out-of-body experience. Mm -hmm. He's on the ayahuasca DMT (laughs) freaking (laughs) Kimura. Jiu-jitsu, man, it feels so good when that happens. Look, I, I haven't, I don't, other than being knocked out or choked out unconscious mm-hmm. in both those categories, where you have an out-of-body experience, which I've definitely had both those, mm-hmm. but to push yourself and that hard in training, like I've never done that, but every time you go hard in training, man, you feel good when you're done. Yeah. And there's something, there's something about jiu-jitsu, I must say, that's better than normal. Like, let's say you and I were like, hey, let's go do a sprint workout. Let's go do a Metcon. Like, let's do something that's so super hardcore that doesn't feel the same. There's not the same goodness. Yeah. Am I wrong? You're uh, you're really right, actually. <laughs> so, and, I, and uh, all, oddly and coincidentally, recently, this was part of my, like, rabbit hole thought process as well. Like, why is that, right? Where it's like, oh, okay, you could say, and which I, I think I would agree with, where it's like, when you're kind of, especially as a male um, human being, you you battling against like another male is like kind of like there's a a payoff on top of the payoff mm-hmm. with that kind of exercise or whatever. Sure, I think that's true. But after a while, I was thinking like, hey, I think I think it's this. I think like you know how like you when you're really good friends with someone. And it's kind of like, oh, I could be doing this thing, but if my friend was here with me, we could do it together. Mm-hmm. And we could like share in the fun times and whatever. And then when you think of that long term, when you have like a really good friend, you share in the fun times and the junk times, then you come back to normal and you can go, you can, hey, remember that time where this thing, and it really sucked, and we, but you guys went through it together. Shared suffering. The shared suffering, mm-hmm. exactly right. So now you have a combination of, and I think some, some, in some weird way, I feel like this is kind of part of the purpose of life, I think. Mm where you have that shared suffering and it's concentrated. Mm -hmm. It's really concentrated. Shared suffering, shared joy, Mm -hmm. exercise, and everything that that comes with. Because it's not like normal exercise. Think about like how hard 10 rounds is. Mm -hmm. Because we did 10 rounds earlier. I only did eight. But (laughs) nonetheless, eight is still, you know. Something. Think how think how hard that is as far as output goes. Yeah. Like if you had one of those monitors or whatever. Like think about it. Like to replicate a workout like that within that amount of time, which is like you know you figure they're five minute rounds, what forty five. I don't know how long in between, but consider the whole time frame. Yeah. And then the output. Yeah. That is a hard workout. Then you know what else is cool is you get done with a jujitsu workout. You know that no matter what level you're at, even if you're a white belt Mm -hmm. and you're on your third month and you train hard, Mm -hmm. you know, you know that you can now beat basically anyone that wasn't in there with you that day. You know what I mean? (laughs) Like, okay, excluding other jujitsu people, obviously, because you're only a white belt, you've only been training for three months. But that's a small number when you talk about the population of Earth. Yeah. So you you get that thing where you're like like even the other day okay we did a bunch of rounds with a bunch of really good people, mm-hmm. just being there on that mat mm-hmm. means that there's most people on planet Earth mm-hmm. you can actually take. Right, they were not on that. Mat. They were not on that mat. Yeah, and yeah, and that yeah that goes with like kind of what I was saying earlier where like you know like that just what that entails and what that kind of delivers to you that's part of like the whole joy of like especially afterwards when everything is settled right that's one of the things that got delivered to you but the part where you kind of connect with another guy Mm -hmm. in that in that way where like me and you are straight up going to battle it's a proxy for a Mm -hmm. battle but we did like as far as our brains are concerned we kind of did so we had the shared suffering we had all that stuff and then we opposed each other and at the end we sort of made up right we're no longer enemies anymore and let's face it when you when you battle with a guy super hard, like in like in real life, like you hate each other or whatever as a kid and you hate each other. And then at the end of the day, you're kind of like, wait a second, we're kind of the same. And then you become friends with them. 
I feel like that's kind of a natural part of existence as well. So I think you get a some kind of a payoff deep down. I think you get some sort of, sort of a payoff, generally speaking, with that rule, right? So I feel like all of those elements all mix together in one experience, the jujitsu experience. I think that's why it feels so good. There's a weird dichotomy. Mm. So the when in Ramadi, we worked with this uh, battalion of soldiers called the first of the 506 Red Curry. I like hear good band things. of brothers, mm-hmm. best, you know, awesome guys. And they had a little saying that was, we stand alone together. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's kind of what happens when you're in jiu-jitsu. Like you, you're alone together. Yeah. So kind of a yeah. cool thing. And you um, think about when you roll with a guy who you've never met before. Mm-hmm. And you roll with them, and you guys have a solid sick roll. Mm-hmm. No matter who gets who, or who doesn't, or tie, or what, it doesn't matter the outcome. But you have a sick roll with mm-hmm. them. You kind of feel connected to them. Oh, for sure. You see that guy the next week, like at the store. Yeah, bro, you're way better friends yeah, yeah, than if yeah, he was in sure. your class in college or something like that. You him getting the groceries out to the car and whatnot. Oh, well, frick it, you guys are kind of <laughs> friends. Yeah. Like you jump <laughs> levels in the relationship with one roll. Um. So. He wins this national championship, right? He's the All Japan National uh, Champion. He says he couldn't sleep for excitement. Despite exhausting two days of competition, he did 500 push ups and a kilometer of bunny hops. But Kimura still didn't sleep well. As he lay down in bed, he said to himself, Today's victory was a fluke. I had more stamina than Nakajima simply because I'm younger than he is. Could I beat him again? Probably not. I would lose next time. This is like obsession level. (laughs) Before the tournament, Kamira's goal had been merely to win the national championship. Now, however, he decided he wanted to remain undefeated champion for 10 years. (laughs) He realized that to accomplish this goal, he would have to redouble his efforts and train harder than anyone else possibly could mulling over his goal he finally came up with what he called triple effort training regimes as he later told it i am the champion others would start to train six hours a day to beat me i could not beat them as long as i trained as hard as others if my opponents train twice as hard as others then i will train three times as hard as others, i.e. nine hours a day. This way I would gain an extra three hours a day and I will do this every day. The accumulation of these extra hours will become my flesh and blood. That is my skills and my mental power. That's what he's doing. Wins the national championship and realizes he's gonna train three times harder than anybody else. All this physical activity gave Kimura a monstrous appetite. The night he won the 1937 championships, he reportedly celebrated by eating 13 bowls of rice. During his prime, he ate seven to eight bowls of rice in the morning, 12 bowls of rice in the evening, plus some fish, such as red snapper and iwashi, which is sardines. This dude's grubbing down. (laughs) Fish and rice. Kimura's principal coach during his prime competing years was Ushijima, Tatsukuma. Ushijima's teaching was as ferocious as his own training. According to Hirano, training under Ushima, Ushi, Ushijima was hell training. A class consisted of five minutes of warm ups, followed by three to four hours of nothing but continuous nawaza, which is interesting to hear. Nawaza is what we do in jiu jitsu, which is rolling, basically. It was considered disgraceful to tap out and surrender when being choked. So at any time, four or five students were likely to be lying unconscious on the tatami as others continued to practice around them. (laughs) Yeah, Mihai and I were laughing about that one. Like there's just bodies, dude. There's just bodies on the mat, you know? And hey, five minute warm up, then four hours of nawaza, four hours of training. I like that. Uchijima's teaching was tough, was as tough psychologically as it was physically his model reported reportedly was attack till your heart stops beating (laughs) he had no patience for self-congratulations or excuses after kimura won eight matches in a row and received his godan at the 1934 kodakan 
competition. He went back to Ushijima to proudly show his accomplishments. Rather than praise him for his victories, however, Ushijima slapped his face repeatedly, telling him that competition is equivalent to a real sword. Kill or get killed duel between Bushi warriors. To throw an opponent means to kill him. Being thrown means being killed. You killed eight men. You got killed by the ninth man. Remember, if you devote your life to judo, you can only survive by throwing your opponents or fighting to a draw, no matter how many tough opponents you face. So ferocious was Ushijima's desire to win that in one famous match, he won a tournament because he he will because in the end he was able to secure his opponent while controlling him using his jaws and teeth to hold him by the belt <laughs> that was the true spirit of bujitsu judo that ushijima and kimura lived by as historian john stevens recounts the style ushijima had trained in was quote extreme there was no such thing as a draw the match went on until one of the competitors gave up or died <laughs> Some matches were fought with a wooden dagger kept in one's belt. If you pinned your opponent, you could mimic cutting off his head with the dagger. Ushijima's judo was the same. Attack, attack, attack. Ushijima visited every dojo he could find to engage anyone who was willing to ran, in willing in Randori and spent much of his nights lifting heavy boulders and striking trees with his hands to bear to build strength. The night before a match, he drank turtle's blood. On the morning of the match, he ate powder made from the body of a poison adder. He would seclude himself in a cave for a week, doing Zazen and reading Musashi's book of five rings. He nearly trained himself to death, developing a life-threatening viral infection that ended his career. Ushijima retired from competition in 1934, thereafter devoting himself to making Kimura's the world's top fighter. So there you go. I mean, no slack. <laughs> uh, having overcome his four losses and adopting a ferocious, a ferocious training program, Kimura went on to win tournament after tournament. He's the champion from 1938 to 1941. Um, talking about that triple effort training, soon after Kimura started his triple effort training, rumors began to circulate about how his rivals were stepping up in their training. And this is what Kimura has to say. Initially, I listened to this information with confidence, thinking I will never lose since I've been training more than nine hours a day. However, after a while, I started to doubt my self-confidence. In those days, I was interested in Zen. I wanted to reach the state of no ego, discover secret judo techniques, and throw around tough opponents using the techniques. But in reality, I missed a chance to go to a Zen temple one after another. That is because it was evident that I would lose my precious time for training by doing so. After all, humans are weak. When they get sick or get into trouble, they depend on God. I was no exception. I meditated trying to reach the state of no ego. I first struggled to reach the state of no ego, but I soon lost the force for struggling and forgot about tomorrow's bout and the fact that I was sitting. Soon after reaching this state, the character win appeared in my mind actually it says appeared on my mind but the character soon got superimposed on the character of loss however my mind was already empty i did not make any effort to get the character of win i don't know how much time has elapsed since i started to sit suddenly my whole body became hot as if somebody poured boiling water over me from the top of my head and my body started to tremble then i noticed the character of win was shining at the center of my forehead as if it had been waiting for me to notice its appearance i will win tomorrow's bouts i was convinced of my victory with pleasure I believe that it was a message from God that can only be given to those who push to the maximum limit of mental and physical strength and get to the broader get to the border between life and death. If I had pursued only pleasure, I would have seen the character of loss. God sides with only those who challenge a difficult task despite the possibility of death. Even though I had wished, even though I even though I had no special belief in any religion, it was my interpretation of the existence of God. I then calmed down from my joyful feeling of victory, turned on the light of the room, and prayed for the protection from various gods. I also prayed to the ancestors of the Kimura family, 
Centuries ago, it is said that Musashi Miyamoto, who was called the greatest swords master, sword master in history, visited a shrine before his battle with the Yoshika, Yoshika family and tried to pull a bell uttering, God, please protect me, but, remained, but regained his calmness and did not ring the bell. I do not count on gods. It was his motto. I thought if I had lived the same era of Musashi, pursued the way of the sword, and even fought Musashi, I would never lose. At worst, the fight would go even. So there you go. Some meditation going on. <sighs> Digging deep. Um, here's a little section I had to talk about because Echo Charles. It's called Kimura, weightlifter ahead of his time. <laughs> Few Japanese martial artists in the first half of the 20th century engaged in si- systematic strength or weightlifting training. Some utilized old school methods, such as Kimura's carrying around a bag of heavy sand. It was not until the late 1950s and early 1960s when American martial artist Don Drager began to introduce Western weightlifting and strength training methods to s- that such exercises became, became commonplace among judoka. Kimura was decades ahead of this time, however. As early as his college years in the mid-1930s, Kimura had became a devoted weightlifter, a method that contributed significantly to his ability to overpower his opponents, albeit with excellent technique. In his prime, Kimura did hundreds of push-ups and other strength exercises, but he supplemented them with bench presses, overhead presses, and other weight training exercises. Although the photo on the next page shows him benching a substantial amount, apparently more than 300 pounds, he mostly focused on high repetitions with moderate weight. According to his own account, he would perform 500 to 600 repetitions of bench with 175 pounds, an astonishing feat of endurance and strength. So this is like, you know, kind of his gig. Yeah. Amazingly, Kimura, had, Kimura made all the foregoing accomplishments before graduating from college. <laughs> That's incredible. But while he was attending Takudai and tearing, and tearing up the judo tatami, the broader world was closing in. Since 1937, Japan had been engaged in a near full-scale war with China, and many of Japan's young men were being drafted in the service. After Kimura's graduation in March 1941, he was kept on as an assistant martial arts department of Takudai, as a judo teacher. He worked in that capacity until November when he resigned and took two months to go home before his military induction in January 1942. Entering the Amkai Air Defense Unit on January 1st, 1942, Kimura apparently was involved in defending Japan's southern sector. He recounts a fascinating story, incident that may have indirectly saved his life. And he says this, one day there was an announcement that a master of Jukendo was to come to our unit. His name was Y, note the name is kept anonymous, who is regarded as the number one in Japan and was eighth Don. All the members in the unit got together in the field at 1 p.m. to receive instruction from Mr. Y. He explained the basics of thrust and defense. He then looked around us and said, any volunteer for practice with me, come forward without any reservation. But nobody came forward. If I engaged in a match with such a master, I would get humiliated or could get killed. Men around me whispered. Suddenly, the captain called my name. Now I cannot retreat. I walked up to the master slowly, as slowly as possible to buy time and come up with a workable strategy. If I engage in a bayonet combat, there is no way I can win. If I would, It would be like a fight between an adult and a child since I had never held a wooden gun in my life. We bowed to each other and held the wooden gun toward each other. I tensed up. The instructor said, thrust, thrust, come on, what's the matter? I knew I would lose as soon as I thrust the gun at him. So I waited for the right moment for attack. I fainted a thrust, then threw the wooden gun at his face with full force. At the moment he deflected the wooden gun, I attacked at his knees, he fell to the ground, I mounted the chest, removed his face guard despite his shouting, wait, wait, and tried to deliver a finishing blow to his face. Stop, stop, it's over. The captain stepped in and separated us, but it was clear that I had won the fight. The master looked as if he did not understand what had happened to him, dropped his head and left the scene. There's a classic. <laughs> Just left, damn. Just left the scene. And that's a classic. You ever done that before? 
what like you know somebody's got a stick somebody's got a you know someone's got something they're gonna they're gonna fight you and you just close the distance no i don't think of no yeah it's one of those things <laughs> where <laughs> you're like mm-hmm, too bad <laughs> It's one of those, hey, you, you know the Dog Brothers, right? Yeah. Yeah, so the Dog Brothers, the Dog Brothers, nothing but awesomeness. Like, these guys were up in the L.A. area. I don't know what they're doing right now. I'll have to look into it. But the Dog Brothers would do weapons fighting. Hmm. Like, go check out their YouTube videos of Dog Brothers. The Dog Brothers would fight with weapons. They'd fight with sticks. Primarily, it started with sticks, but then you mm. see people in there with chains mm. and with all kinds of crazy stuff. And they'd wear like a Kempo helmet usually. Mm. And maybe they'd wear lacrosse gloves mm. so you wouldn't get like broken fingers, which we talked about. But other than that, it was on. Mm. So you'd have, you'd have two guys with sticks or staffs yeah. or nunchucks, like legit. And they would fight each other. Yeah. Chains. Like, it's mayhem. Well, there's some videos where people are jujitsu guys. Mm. And what the jujitsu guys would do is kind of what this says. Just, you know, throw a stick at them and then just bum rush them and close the distance. Because once you're on somebody, mm-hmm. their, their striking isn't going to work anymore. Yeah. So that's, this is a good plan if you're a, if you're a grappler. Yeah. You don't want to fight someone, you know, with a bayonet that's trained with bayonet. You don't want to fight a boxer that's trained in boxing. Mm. You want to train a Muay Thai guy that's training Muay Thai. You want to close the distance. You want to get it close to him so their striking doesn't work or run away. Mm. But that's what Kimura did. Crazy. Needless to say, Kimura was was sure he was going to catch hell from the captain. This is after the guy ran away. But the effect was quite the opposite. Not long afterward, an announcement was made that those who wished to be sent to combat should see the captain. Kimura volunteered and was given a five-day leave to visit his parents. When he returned, he reported to the captain who said, I have known about your achievements in judo. I like judo too and often practice in a Kodokan. Compared with you, I must be like a kid, but I still got the fourth don. He poured whiskey into a glass and continued. The match you did with the Jukendo, Jukendo master was very interesting. First, nobody stepped forward. I knew nobody had a chance against him since he was the best master in the country. But if nobody volunteered, the dignity of our unit would be tarnished. So, even though I thought I would be discourteous to you, I picked you. But once the match started, I got badly shaken when I saw your posture since you looked like a complete novice. Yes, that is right. I had never grabbed a wooden gun before. I thought so, but I did not even imagine the tactics you used. I felt like bowing to you, thinking, after all, a man who excels in one art is different from others. After the match, Mr. Y came to me and asked, who in the world is he? I then told him about your achievements. He was deeply impressed, saying, no wonder he's the number one judo master in the world. The captain then paused and turned his eyes downward, engaging in thought. He continued, this is super top secret, so do not tell us to anyone. He lowered his voice tone and said, do you really want to go to the battlefield? Yes, absolutely. Really? But that's a problem. I had no idea what the problem was. You will be sent to the Solomon Islands, he said. It is certain that B-29s, w- B-29s will be waiting for our unit. Our plan is absolutely reckless. All the members on board will perish in the ocean. Don't you think it's better to use your talent in judo and work for the benefit of the country instead of wasting your life on the battlefield? I think that is the right thing for you. Do you still want to go to the battlefield? I replied, yes, I do. Suddenly, his tone of voice changed. My order is the emperor's order. You are not allowed to go. After all, it became an order. I had to follow his order. I said, I will withdraw my volunteer application. He then murmured, very good, very good. Later on, I heard that the transportation ship unit I was going to get on board was discovered by B-29s immediately before reaching the Solomon Islands, had oil scattered over the entire deck, received numerous bombs, and was engulfed in flames. Of over 500 and several tens of members, only one of them survived and managed to swim to a nearby island despite a severe burn. In retrospect, I owe my life to the captain. Judo moved him and saved my life. Kimura stayed for the rest of his tour on the mainland Japan, apparently transferred to a 
post near Asakura, his home island in southern Japan. Although he was in the army, he reportedly was allowed to teach judo once a week at the high school. Kimura was known as a heavy drinker as well as smoker, and according to one account, showed up at the school one day after drinking excessive amount of sake. He was holding a class on Nawaza. After demonstrating the chokeholds, he called on the students to try them out on him. Although Kamira was extremely strong and had a neck like a bull, he was choked into unconsciousness by one of the students as a result of his intoxication. There's no evidence that this experience reformed his drinking habits, but it must have been at least mildly embarrassing for the national judo champion to have been choked out by a mere high school kid. He's on that sauce. It's very strange. Uh, you know, you, you just, the alcohol is so strong. Yeah. You know, this guy's got to know that it's not helping his judo career. Remember, we were talking about addictive personalities. Yeah, sounds like he's in the game. <laughs> he's in, yeah. in the zone. <laughs> I mean, nine hours of training a day. Yeah. That sounds like it might be addictive personality. Alcohol yeah. is just one of the many. Things. He's smoking cigarettes. Smoking cigarettes. Kimura got married on July 1st, 1945, even as Japan was preparing to face invasion by the increasingly victorious Allied armies and navies. The fast forward here, the war is over. The occupation authorities closed down the Butokutai the headquarters for all martial arts, and banned the practice of judo, kendo, and other militaristic endeavors. Shut it down. He says here, fast forward a little bit, I was standing at the end of a line of 60 or 70 people waiting for a train and was reading a paperback. Suddenly four MP, this is military police, this is the occupation forces, men passed through the line nearby me forcibly. When I turned my eyes to them, I found them shouting, Jap, Jap, repeatedly. One of them grabbed the Japanese man at the front of the line by the collar, pulled the man toward him, and made a ring with the pointing finger and thumb and stuck the nose of the Japanese man with the flipped pointing finger with full force. The man covered his nose with his hands and stooped down from the pain. The MP did this to the MP men did this to everyone in the line, one by one, including women. When someone did not stoop low, they delivered another strike. My turn was approaching. While I was wondering about what to do, my turn came. One of the MP men extended his arm, trying to grab my lapel. I struck his hand with full force. The facial expression changed suddenly. The four MP men surrounded me and took me to the middle of a bridge nearby the station. This was not an ordinary fight to me. I had to win this fight to defend the honor of judo. One of them came suddenly and threw a right straight at my face. I blocked the punch with my left arm and kicked him in the groin with full force. He crumpled on the spot. When I turned back my head, another huge MP extended his arms and attacked me, trying to grab me from behind. I then hit his right arm with a hard knife hand and threw him into the river. There were two, the other two were watching the scene in amazement, but charged at me only one by one. I delivered a headbutt into the face of the third man. He was knocked out. I disposed of the last man by squeezing his balls with full force. Ever since I was in junior high, I have been called master groin squeezer and had an absolute confidence in this technique. I had asked all the audience to keep it quiet since I would be in big trouble if news got to the MP supervisors. But somebody must have leaked the news. I started to regret what I had done, but my concern turned out to be unnecessary. When I got to the MP headquarters, Captain Shepard said, thank you for punishing the rogue MPs. They are the worst ones in our unit. They've sexually assaulted women, ate and drank without paying, threatened people with a pistol. We were about to be forced to punish them. They are also depressed after you beat them up. I'm truly thankful to you. I heard that you are the greatest judo master in Japan. I have a request to you. Could you teach us judo once or twice a week? Of course, I will pay you. I myself am anxious to learn judo. So that's how he kind of starts bringing it back. That's a scene out of a movie though, huh? Yep. Just kicking four guys' ass. But you can see how it's happening. Again, this is at a time where like, you know, these guys, what? Couple MPs, four MPs. Did one of those guys wrestle? Apparently not. Did one of those guys box? Apparently not. If they're just random dudes, and you're talking about, yeah, a dude that's bench pressing uh, 175 pounds 600 times an hour, and he trains judo nine hours a day. Yeah, 
This is a skilled world dude. champion. World champion. Uh, borderline unbeatable human being. Yeah. That's when you see a movie and a guy takes on four people, you're kind of like, ah, you know, but if you put in the light of this actual human, yeah, yeah. We're, and, we're, we're nodding in agreement. And you're talking about like a judo guy, right? Where it's not like a, like a, you know, I mean, no, no disrespect to the Aikido, but like, you know, let's say if it's yeah, Aikido yeah. guys, like it's different, you know, judo guy training that hard for real judo for that long, that effective, that successful against an untrained guy, just one-on-one, this guy literally is like one of the easiest things to defeat as a person. (laughs) It's like super easy, right? Now you got four of them, it's actually not that much of a factor. I mean, sure, you're gonna take some this, a hit here and there or whatever, but his training is harder than probably anything they could do to him as far as like hitting him or whatever. Just one training session is way harder, way more uh, uh, adverse. And they're used to beating people up. Oh, yeah. You know, they're not used to any aggression whatsoever, so they don't even have the idea to like gang tackle this guy. They can't even get their mind right. They're they're just, even two of them are watching this happen. (laughs) You know what I mean? (laughs) Yeah, that to me is very, very, very believable. And they're surprised as they're watching, you see guys getting their asses kicked, see a guy get thrown into the river. Yeah, You're like, what the hell just happened? Imagine if you haven't really seen all that, you know, and you see, two, three of your friends just get handled like super easily, yeah. almost like this guy's been training for this exact moment, and then now you're next, yeah. and you have no training. Yeah. Or maybe this some street training, because that's their jam, right? You just have no idea what you're doing. No idea. You, you go to grab the guy, and you're literally getting thrown. Like a judo like like a judo player, it's hard for you and me to imagine, because we've been training for so long, it's hard to imagine what it's like to not have any training. You know, I don't remember what it's like to not know jujitsu anymore. I, I mean, when I talk about like Master Chief Bailey, like I just remember that instance of like, well, this is confusing. But I don't remember what was actually, what it was like the day before that. And like if I would have looked, and I've been in a lot of fights actually growing up, I've been in a lot of fights. But what my thought process was was just ignorant. And in, in ignorance is the wrong word. It's just like a hollow emptiness. Yeah, like bl- like a big blindness. Yeah. Like you don't you don't see anything. You yeah. see one or two things and you think that's the whole story. Yeah. One like, it's not even no part idea. of the story. You yeah. just have no idea. Check. Yeah. Uh talks a little bit more about the ban on martial arts. The ban of martial the ban on teaching martial arts extended to all levels of schools. The banning of judo schools, one of the pre war strongholds of judo training seriously impacted the ability of pre-war judoka to practice and eliminated hundreds of teaching jobs for for top judoka. As late as 1947, there was still great confusion about the legal status of teaching and practicing traditional martial arts, especially in schools at all levels. It was not till between 1947 and 1950 that controls on the martial arts were loosened and judo and other martial arts were again permitted to be taught in schools. Even if such, and I'm just skimming some of these highlights of what you know what he's going through. Even if such restrictions had not been imposed on the teaching and practice of judo, many judoka were in no economic position to spend their time training. This was true of Kimura as well. From the end of the war, Kimura was was unable to practice at all. He was trying to support his family with unstable jobs such as broker for coal sales, bodyguard, etc. Nonetheless, Kimura entered one of the first judo tournaments held after the war, war, 1947 West Japan Judo Championship. Kimura's prize, he won that. Kimura's prize for defeating both opponents was the equivalent of $10,000. Damn, that's pretty good in 1947, hell yeah. Much needed windfall that helped him support his family during the difficult early post-war years. Following the tournament, Kimura was promoted to seventh Don. The first All Japan Championship held since 1940 was was contested on May 2nd, 1948. Kimura likely would have been a favorite, but was denied entry because of his refusal to return the championship flag, which he had kept after winning four consecutive All Japan Championship tournaments before the war. So this is something that came up, and there there basically was given a flag, and he didn't return it to like the judo people, mm. and they were mad at him, mm. and they were really mad at him, and so they didn't even let him in the tournament. Um, he Kimura did participate in the 1949 All Japan Champ Championship at age 32. He remembered his match against Ishikawa, one of the toughest and most consistent opponents. 
um, after a second overtime, and again, I'm fast forwarding, but there's really cool details about these about these matches. After a second overtime, the judge's decision had to be rendered. All three judges both raised both red and white flags. It was a draw. The 1949 championships was the highlight of Kimura's judo career. It was the last time Kimura would compete in the All Japan Championship, leaving him with four wins and a co-championship. So that last time that he competed, he actually had a draw, and there was dual champions there. Shortly after 1949, after winning 1949 All Japan Championship, Kimura was offered the highly prestigious position of judo instructor of the Tokyo Metropolitan Police. He began working there in April of 1950, but the salary was insufficient to support his family, now consisting of a wife, son, and daughter, especially since his wife had contracted tuberculosis. Medicine was extremely rare and expensive in post war Japan. Kimura could simply not afford treatment on the police department salary. And the reason that this is important to bring up is because he had to figure out what to do to get money. Luckily, there's a new startup. New startup, I don't know if they used that term back in the day, but there's a professional judo came out. In pro judo's first tournament, Kimura worked his way through various opponents to reach the finals where he faced six Don Yamaguchi Toshio. Kimura beat Yamaguchi by a Sotogari followed by a pin, becoming the first professional judo champion. Then this guy that he fought, Yamaguchi, started getting into the pro wrestling scene. Mm. And uh, there's a whole a whole story that we need to get Josh Barnett on here okay. to get, that we can get down and get the whole history of Japanese professional wrestling and where it came from and how it went. And we got the Americans that came over, the Americans that were catch wrestlers that went over to Japan and taught these guys how to do this stuff. Um, but Kimura got involved in that and you know went to Hawaii, given a three month contract to demonstrate judo on the Hawaiian Islands. Pro wrestling, fast forward a little bit, pro, pro wrestling promoter gave him a, a offer to take part in weekly pro wrestling bouts. Money was great. He was able to get the medicine, able to buy the medicine for his wife. She was able to recover from her disease. Um, now, meanwhile in Brazil, there was a guy, another judo guy named Kato. Kato weighed about 154 pounds. Elio Gracie weighed 139. Gracie faced Cato twice. In the first match on September 6, 1951, Cato and Gracie met at the Maracana Stadium in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil for a three-round draw. So the first time we had judo versus jiu-jitsu, it was a draw. Guys that were roughly equal. I mean, 15 pounds is no joke, honestly. <laughs> but they're more equal than some of these other matches that are going on at the time. Um, then they had a second bout, a second bout, September 29th, 1951. It's only 23 days later. Going to uh, a, a quote or a story told by Kimura about the second match, the rules of the bout were different from that of judo or pro wrestling. The winner was decided by submission only. Yeah. <laughs> no matter how cleanly a throw was executed or how long... Uh, someone was pinned, it does not count. He issued the challenge to Kato, fifth Don first. The gong rang, Kato was in good condition and threw Elio a number of times. However, past the 15 minute mark, I started, to see, again, this is this is Kimura watching this. I started to see frustration in Kato's face. The throws <laughs> had no damage on Elio since the mat was soft. At the 30 minute mark, it was evident that Kato was tired. What's the matter, Kato? Go Nuaza, don't stand up, the Japanese in the audience yelled. Kato then threw Elio down by Osotogari, mounted on Elio, and started a crosshand choke. The audience roared with excitement, but as I watched carefully, Elio was also applying a choke from below. They were trying to choke out each other. This lasted about three or four minutes. Kato's face started to turn pale. I shouted stop to the referee and jumped into the ring. When Elio released his hands, Kato collapsed on the mat face first. By beating Kato, Gracie became instant national hero. Unfortunately, his supporters went overboard in celebrating his victory as Kimura remembered it. Two days after his bout, I saw Elio's students marching down a city street carrying a coffin. <laughs> <laughs> they were shouting, dead Japanese judoka Kato is in this coffin. He got killed by Elio. We asked your support for judo 
Master Elio Gracie. So <laughs> Gracie's going hard going in the paint hard. even back in the day, dude. <laughs> Just bringing out a coffin. There's actually a picture of young Elio Gracie in here. And you know Elio Gracie in most pictures, he looks kind of frail and weak. Like, look at that picture right there. Oh, damn. Okay. He looks oh, legit. Right. It's like the only stink. picture yeah. I've seen him where you go, oh, yeah. You could tell this dude's training Maybe all the time. The, yeah, so take a look at that. Some, put some traps. Damn. Yeah, so he's okay. kind of jacked. Okay. Yeah. He's wearing a singlet. He's wearing a wrestling singlet. <laughs> so what happens after this? Kato gets beat. It's a shame for judo. Kimura now accepts the match. And so now we have a match of, of Kimura versus Elio Gracie. One of the most significant matches in the history of martial arts. Mm. Am I wrong? Uh, you're not wrong, I don't think. No. I mean, it's one of the most significant matches in the history of martial arts. And we, that's what I opened with is how Elio Gracie remembered it, what he thought of it. That was what we covered in the opening of this. Let's hear, let's hear how Kimura describes this match. He says, 20,000 people came to see the bout, including the president of Brazil. <laughs> Elio Gracie was 180 centimeters and 80 kilograms. When I, which I think is, you know, I think Elio would say he was lighter than that, but because 80 kilograms is 165 pounds. More than that, so yeah. yeah. And, and yet, they usually say Alia was like 145 pounds or something yeah. like that. Anyways, when I entered the stadium, I found a coffin. <laughs> I asked what it was. I was told, this is for Kimura. Alio brought this in. It was so funny that I almost burst into laughter. As I approached the ring, raw eggs were thrown at me. The gong rang. Elio grabbed me in both lapels and attacked me with a sotagari, but they did not move me at all. Now it's my turn. I blew him up in the air with a bunch of different throws. I'm not going to read them all. At about the 10 minute mark, I threw him by a sotagari. I intended to cause a concussion, but since the mat was so soft, it did not have much impact on him. While continuing to throw him, I was thinking of a finishing method. I threw him by, by Osotogari again. As soon as Elio fell, I pinned him. I held still for two or three minutes, then tried to smother him with my belly. Elio shook his head, trying to breathe. He could not take it any longer and tried to push my body up, extending his left arm. That moment, I grabbed his left wrist with my right hand and twisted his arm. I applied the entangled arm lock or the Kimura. I thought he would surrender immediately, but Elio would not tap the mat. I had no choice but to keep twisting on his arm. The stadium became quiet. The bone of his arm was coming close to breaking point. Finally, the sound of bone breaking echoed throughout the stadium. Elio still did not surrender. His left, left arm was already powerless. Under this rule, I had no choice but to twist the arm again. There was plenty of time left. I twisted the arm again. Another bone was broken. Ilio still did not tap. When I tried to twist the arm once more, a white towel was thrown in. I won by TKO. My hand was raised. Japanese Brazilians rushed into the ring and tossed me up in the air. On the other hand, Elio left, let his arm hang and looked very sad withstanding the pain so there's a video of this by the way yep. you can go go watch this match pretty awesome um, <clears throat> the the uh, the headline of the newspaper um, says moral victory of he of Elio Gracie but the funny thing is the moral victory the moral part is really tiny, and so it just basically <laughs> says victory for Helio Gracie. Mm. And, and look, in their minds, they it was a victory mm. because they thought, hey, here's a guy that's a lot lighter, a lot smaller, a lot less athletic, and he was able to go a long time against this champion. So it was a moral victory for look at look at that, look at that title. <laughs> <laughs> the, so there was definitely the uh, some some bias in the media. We'll say back then. Uh, with that. You know, that's, like I said, one of the most significant matches in the history of martial arts. 
Um, going back to the book here a little bit and fast forward, Kimura decided to join the growing and increasingly popular world of Japanese professional wrestling in November 1951. And then there's this whole story about this up and coming pro wrestling star who had fought under the stage name of Riki Dozan. He established his own wrestling federation called the Japan Pro Wrestling Alliance. Riku Dozan is often called the father of Japanese pro wrestling and has even said without him, there likely would be no such thing as pro wrestling in Japan. Riki Dozan had trained on, in karate and in sumo and reached the third highest rank. Before long, Riku Dozan and Kimura decided to pair up in an effort to put together a winning playbill and hike their income. Now he goes into this thing about these guys named the Sharp Brothers, Ben and Iron Mike, both 6'5 and over 250 pounds. So I'm, I'm sure these are Americans that rolled over there. And they were gonna do a, uh, they did a series of tag team matches against Rika Dazan and Kimura, against these two guys, the Sharp Brothers. And this is, this is pro wrestling. These are kind of worked matches we're getting into where we know what's gonna happen, right? And this, they're trying to, it's literally like pro wrestling today. Yeah. But again, this Japanese pro wrestling, there's th- things that are real that happen, there's things that aren't. Again, we gotta get Josh Barnett down here with his knowledge, exceptional knowledge of all this stuff to talk us through it. Um, so then this happens. Their growing popularity led the media and the public to push for a bout between Kimura and Riki Dozan, billed as the duel of the century. The match was to last 60 minutes. Kimura remembers what happens. What happened next. I met with Riki Dozan and asked his opinion. He said, that is a good idea. We will be able to build a fortune. Let's do it. The first bout was going to be a draw. The winner of the second bout would be determined by paper, scissors, stone. After the second match, we will repeat this process. We came to an agreement on this condition. So this is all just fake. It's fake pro wrestling. As for the content of the match, Riki Dozan will let me throw him and I will let him strike me with a chop and we rehearse the karate chops and the throws. So this is just a big, you know, big pro wrestling show. However, once the bout started, Riki Dozan became taken by greed for big money and fame. He lost his mind and became a madman. When I saw him raise his hand, I opened my arms to invite the chop. He delivered the chop not to my chest, but to my neck with full force. I fell to the mat, then he kicked me. Neck arteries are so vulnerable that it did not need to be Ricky Dozon to cause a knockdown. A junior high school kid could inflict a knockdown this way. I could not forgive his treachery. That night I received a phone call informing me that several tens of Yakuza are on their way to Tokyo to kill Ricky Dozon. Bam. Yeah, <laughs> it's some mayhem. <laughs> and he goes on, he goes on um, eventually Ricky Dozon. He didn't get killed that night, but he died, of, he died later um, from other issues stabbed with a short story. I mean, it's it, that was like 10, 10 years later or something like that. But uh, kind of terrible. You ever seen some of those matches gone wrong? Oh, no. Wait, the Japan the, the Any Japan pro ones? wrestling? No, I, no. I, I didn't. I'm not, I wasn't. You've seen occasionally someone get caught in a Kimura, actually? Yeah, yeah, you see remnants of that yeah. stuff all like, the time, like yeah. People get pissed. <laughs> well, I always thought it was part of the show. Sometimes. Mm-hmm. There's one famous one where I think Kurt Angle gets caught in a Kimura by like a young upcoming wrestler that knew jujitsu mm-hmm. and like puts it on him for real. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's kind of messed up. Yeah, I, well, and I don't know the deal, um, but I wonder how choreographed or how like intro do they is every detail kind of sorted out beforehand or is it just sort of like hey here's the gig you go you get ahead and you come back then you get ahead and then you come back and win or or like well i don't know I, what I the think deal they actually is. know what's up yeah it's like almost like you you have to go to practice with them right? i mean i bet oh, let's say you and i we're gonna do an exhibition match yeah probably be the same thing that we do i'd be like hey man you know i'll come out and like kind of get, let me get a good throw on you and then i'll, I'll get you in a good position you can escape yeah, and you could start putting the heat on me and whatever. We just figured out, yeah. and we could we could act that out pretty easily. Yeah, just with our knowledge. 
there's a difference between that us getting together beforehand, like day mm-hmm. of, and like weeks of like kind of practicing it together. You know, right. I wonder how in depth it goes. Because some of them, I was well, actually coincidentally, like within the past week or so, I saw it was um w, it was the female one. And I was like, bro, they didn't really practice this because there was a lot of dead time yeah. and kind of confusion, you know. Was it like a professional yeah, one, like on TV? A, yeah, the one with the lights and the video they and have everything. Like, they have local pro wrestling, you know. Oh, for like, real? You can go check that out. I think I might. There's some there's some wildness. I went to yeah. one of those things. It was freaking awesome. <laughs> Guys were going crazy. Like, you're looking at them impressed. Like, this is dangerous. Like, yeah. whatever they're doing. I seen a guy jump off of a building. <laughs> I saw a guy jump off of a building (laughs) in Ocean Beach, California in a wrestling match. Jump off of a building and land in a ring on somebody. Oh, damn. Like, if I did that or if you did that, we would be hurt 100%. Yeah, pretty much any building. I I don't know what kind of drugs these dudes are on or what they're taking, you know, whether they're on whatever. But, hey, man. Some pain reliever scenarios. There you go. Definitely some pain reliever scenarios going on. I do know that there's technique though to the to the safety of oh, the for move. Sure. So for like sure. the um, there actually used to be this reality show on like wrestling school uh-huh. or whatever. So I think that's my initial um, knowledge from mm-hmm. like the little techniques. But you know how you know the one I don't know the the names of the moves. But when the guy's laying on his back and you do like a drop with the back of your leg, yeah. you jump up and you land on with the back of your leg on his face. Yeah. You like, you know, you yeah, make the little space. First, yeah. yeah, like your knees kind of bent or whatever. There's like all these techniques. And even it's funny like that jujitsu is the complete opposite of that. You're just trying to hurt the other person. <laughs> yeah, everything's. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like you take away that space. Yeah, make so. it more effective. But yeah, I do wonder how that is. I think, um, oh, freaking Sakuraba was in that for a bit. Yes. The definitely pro wrestling. Was, definitely was. Yeah. And see, that's the thing in Japan and in MMA and pro wrestling and shoot wrestling and paint. There was all kinds of crossover. There were work fights. There were not work fights. So there's a there's a lot of stuff going on there. Yeah. A lot of stuff that it's hard to follow. That's funny how, like, the guy um, deviated from the script and then the Yakuza was immediately on his trail. Yeah. That is fun. Not funny, but that's interesting right there. Yeah, and then immediately. you wonder, did they have bets on it? Yeah. I mean, were they betting on this even though everyone knew it was fake? Like, what's going on? Or he's not allowed to do that kind of violation? I don't know, right? Ruining the show for us. Maybe that I'm sure there's a bunch of other stuff that's kind of dependent, you know, riding on, on that show. It's been weird. Way. You can always hear, uh, like, when Rogan's talking to somebody that they're into pro wrestling, he, mm-hmm. he doesn't get, like, I'm that mm-hmm. way too. Like, I can't, I can't, I can't buy into it. You know, mm-hmm. I can't be like, oh, that's cool. Right. Like Rick Rubin the other day. Rick Rubin's a huge fan of pro wrestling. Yeah. He's, he's like talking about how it's more like life than you see. <laughs> like I, do, I mean, I'm sure at some point we'll talk through it, but yeah. him and uh, Tony uh, Hinchcliffe, he's totally into it. Yeah. And I've heard, you know, him and, and it seems like Joe has a hard time with like yeah. figuring out why it's cool. And I'm, yeah. I'm, I agree with Joe. Like it's hard yeah. when you can watch two humans fight in a cage for real, why would you possibly want to wa- watch two people act it out? It just yeah. doesn't make sense to me. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure there's something we're missing as far as the, the pro wrestling in life parallel, but yeah. you, know, you never know, right? Yeah. I mean, how much pro wrestling do you watch? Yeah, I don't watch enough, man. Yeah. You know, I don't watch enough. I, I, it's hard for me to watch it because it takes a long time too. Yeah. You know what I, you know what I will give up? I will concede, you know, when you see a clip, mm. you know, a clip of some pro wrestling. Yeah. That might be pretty cool. Hell yeah. You know, like uh, back in the day totally. when all of a sudden the gong would go because the Undertaker's like showing up. <laughs> sure, sure. Or Undertaker. like Stone Cold Steve Austin. Yeah. Like the, whatever entry, wild entry he has. Yeah. You know, so, so th- you're right about there's that. There's some dramatic elements that we give credit to. We They're have to give really credit. fun. So, con- and when you consider that part of it, and I'm remembering back to my childhood days where I didn't really watch the whole thing, but you know, like they'd have the commercials for it. I'd be mm-hmm. like, bro, that event whatever they're doing in there. I don't care what they're doing. Whatever they're doing, <laughs> that looks fun. So, and then you have all these crazy characters, like when The Rock was in his heyday and when Do You Smell What The Rock Is Good? Yeah, because yeah. we were waiting for that. We were oh, waiting yeah. for him to say that. <laughs> and then, you know, like, and you know, he, you know what he's about to do because he has the whole ritual, you know, the, the people's eyebrow and all this stuff. So, um, the, so when they came out with like the real characters, mm-hmm. like I, and the earliest I remember is the, there was like two twin brothers. Mm-hmm. And they had a movie or whatever, but it was like that era. It's like eighties, and then um, 
who was it? The freaking Ultimate Warrior. Yeah. Hulk Hogan, like all those guys. When they when they were like these these characters are really Hulk Mania running wild. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know. Man. So that event just started getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Yeah, and then these stunts are all crazy or whatever. So yeah, yeah you individualize like a certain sequence or a yeah. certain like action or whatever. Oh yeah, I see it. I see it. Yeah. But at the end of the day, I think what you're talking about or what we're talking about is when you watch two guys like in UFC, we'll say, and they're really fighting, you don't know who's going to win. You don't know how. This is yep. going to be hard. It's going to be a tough fight. It's a real fight. If he gets elbowed or kneed in the face, bro, it's like there's some real consequences. Yep. And then you're like, okay, this one's obviously like choreographed. Like yeah. obviously that I, part I, of it is hard. I guess what we're missing is, you know, to give credit to Rick Rubin and Tony Hinchcliffe is like if they're tracking that whole story, it's like have you ever watched Breaking Bad? Some or it. some series, yeah, some yeah, series yeah. on TV where there's a bunch of characters and there's stuff happening. Yeah, yeah, stuff, and stuff. so you go, oh, this is a cool story and we're going to follow it. Yeah, yeah. I've never participated enough in that thing to really like understand all the stuff that's yeah. going on. So that is that's a, probably why those guys are into it and super yeah. hype about it. Yeah. And I doubt that Joe has ever participated in enough or paid enough attention to be like, wait a second, who's yeah. going to win tonight? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Because but, it's real easy just to be like, who's going to win tonight? There's no winning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, So I'm not going to watch it because it's not real. Even if not real. Yeah, yeah exactly. So. But, that, but that's a good point, though. And Because, yeah. Like but I you got to make an investment in it. Yes. Like and I'm show. not really willing. Really, I'm really honestly not willing to invest in something when I could. I would much rather watch two people fight for real. So, do you, and you, you mentioned Breaking Bad. So did you watch Breaking Bad? Yes. Is that one where you kind of know, oh, remember when that happened? Do you know kind of the storyline, give or take? Breaking Bad. Yeah, yeah, it's it's a story. It's yeah. one big story. Right. So, are you familiar with that particular story, though? Breaking Fairly, yeah. yeah. I okay, mean, yeah. I am now that I watched it. Yes. I, mean, I can't so, recall it all right off the top of my head. Yeah. So perfect. So if you if you get into a show like that, and you mm. know you got Netflix is really good at that right now. Mm. Like the format yeah, yeah, is yeah. like, oh, you can't wait for the next one, kind of thing. See what happens. All this stuff. All these turns. So it's essentially that, but in the wrestling combat yeah. sports format. And honestly, I don't even know if there is a sustaining plot through the professional wrestling i don't even know there i don't, might be there I might not either. be i don't know I, and actually you're right so i will here's my my uh my statement if there is i can see it now yeah yeah good before it's like all this other stuff sure we know so just like we know breaking bad's not real yeah. you know if you're there to really see a real meth lab be operated then you're not gonna like breaking bad because you're gonna be like this is just a, not real yeah. you know but if you like the story it grabbed you or whatever i think pro wrestling and i can see how they could do a good job too with these characters mm -hmm. bro i totally see it yeah now John Cena. Mm -hmm. So, you know the idea of when, um, not the idea, but uh, they take John Cena. They, there's a clip. I don't know if it's just one clip or they always say it or what. what and they, he says, and his name is John Cena. You ever heard that? Uh, nope. What? Okay. This is the, I know a little bit about maybe the 80s wrestlers yeah. and then maybe the, some of the 90s wrestlers. Like we're talking Hulk Hogan, yeah. Ultimate Warrior, mm -hmm. Undertaker, yeah. Stone Cold Steve Austin. Mm -hmm. Maybe even a little bit further back like Andre the Giant and, mm -hmm. and the Iron Sheik. But again, ne at never in any moment in my life were they anything more than like a highlight reel. Yeah. Yeah. At the same boat for sure. But these clips are so like used for a bunch of other stuff now so it's like his name is john diamond Cena. dallas page oh yeah i just oh, thought yeah. of him because he has ddp <laughs> yoga he's out there getting after it oh, yeah. seems to help people out good for ddp oh yeah um but it's so like hype you know where it's like and his name is john Cena. i'm sure they say it at a very mm. specific time i mm. i actually don't think i've ever, i recall them actually using that clip mm -hmm. in real life i've never heard see, heard it or seen it be done but now they'll do it on videos where like you know like if um you ever seen that video henzo always freaking posted or he used to always post it where it's like two guys are fighting right mm -hmm. and then somebody comes like out of nowhere <laughs> and comes with like a huge jump kick yeah, and like yeah, hits yeah. you or whatever so this is for example how they would use that clip it's just the audio clip uh -huh. his name is john cena then it plays this Boom. music mm -hmm. So it'll have like a unrelated video, mm -hmm. right, of two people really fighting in real life, like a street fight or yeah, something, yeah. And like a crowd bar fight or something, and then someone come flying out of nowhere, and then they'd say, they'd play the clip yeah. audio, and his name is John Cena, right when they land the kick, and it goes, burr, 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 and it's this big thing. So that hype that they have isolated and individualized, when I understand and feel that hype when they play it on all kinds of different clips, <laughs> by the way. That feeling that I get, if even a fraction of that is involved in pro wrestling, I get it. Yeah, there you go. All right. Tony Hinchcliffe and Rick Rubin. Carry on.
and yeah you guys we're, we're down we're, we're our minds are open to your, to your things here uh, fast forward a little bit in March 1955 Camiro went to Mexico to do pro wrestling matches in November he traveled to France to teach judo during judo during the daytime and do pro wrestling matches at night he did the same for London spending a year in Paris and London from there Camiro traveled to Spain for four months to teach judo and pro wrestling you can kind of see where his life is heading to um, Back to Brazil in 1959, returned to Brazil. What was be his last pro wrestling and judo tour? He was challenged by Valdemar San- Santana, 27-year-old champion of Gracie Jiu-Jitsu, Capoeira, and boxing. Kimura claimed that Santana had a fourth don in judo, though this may have been his rank in Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. At six foot, 205 pounds, he was taller, heavier, and much younger than Kimura, now 42. The year before, Santana had knocked out Elio Gracie in a fight lasting three hours and 45 minutes. That's no no time limit activity right there. Uh, So these two guys fight. Kimura threw Santana, applied his uh, Kimura lock. Then they did a rematch. This rematch was Valley Tudo. Kimura hurt his left knee. Uh, the promoter insisted that they fight anyway. He says, if you refuse to fight today, the angry audience will set fire to the arena. If this arena got burnt to ash, I would make you accountable for the damage. So he gets pressured into this fight with little choice. Kimura went ahead with the fight. I'm gonna they give some pretty good detail around the fight. He says, I traded kicks with him. The entire audience was standing with excitement. Even in this situation, I was able to think clearly. I was thinking he's one level higher than I, both in kicks and open hand strikes in order to win, I must take the fight to the ground. Fast forward a little bit, all of a sudden I received a head cracking impact. I experienced a tremendous ear ringing, got momentarily unconscious. I had received a headbutt on my left temple. It was a headbutt from the side. I had thought that all headbutts would come from the front. I never knew of a side headbutt. Then he says, I cannot lose here. I must win even if I may die, I thought. Driven by this willpower, I tried to find a way to fight back. The referee came between us to separate us. We were already covered in blood. The fight was brought back to the center of the ring again. He threw an open right hand strike. I caught the arm and attempted a throw. It seemed like it would score. I would score a clean throw. However, it was a miscalculation. We were both heavily covered with sweat as if a large amount of water had been poured onto our heads. Moreover, he had no jacket on. There was no way such a technique could have worked under these conditions. His arm slipped through and my body rotated in air once forward and I landed on my back. So this is classic, right? He tries a judo throw, but they're all sweaty. Mm. I mean, it's, it's kind of crazy. When, we, when we're doing jujitsu, it's like, oh yeah, this sweat here. Like, oh yeah, I can't do that when it's sweaty. We literally say that now, mm. even about you know, heel hooks. Like if someone's super sweaty with a heel hook, it's hard to get a heel hook. Harder. Mm-hmm. Arm lock. If someone gets super sweaty, it's harder to get it. Throws, judo throws, yeah. real hard. Mm. I screwed up. I shouted in my mind, but it was too late. He immediately jumped at me. If he got on my chest, he could freely strike my eyes, nose, chest with his elbows. I caught him in a body scissors. I squeezed his body with full force, hoping to sever his intestine. He crumbled momentarily, but did not surrender. Since the body scissors did not finish him, I realized that I was in a disadvantageous position. When I lifted my head, I saw, when I lifted my head, hundreds of stars flew out of my eyes. I took a straight punch in the nose and my eyes. It was an accurate, intense punch. The back of my head got slammed onto the mat. Moreover, an intense headbutt attacked my abdomen. I felt like my organs would be torn into pieces. Once, twice, I hardened my abdominal muscles to withstand the impact and waited for a third attack. At the moment the third headbutt came, my right fist accurately caught his face by counter. It landed between his nose and eyes, blood spattered. I had also been heavily covered in blood. The blood interfered with my vision. Kill him, kill him, the devil in my mind screamed. He wobbled and stepped back and tried to run with the ropes on his back. I chased him throwing kicks and open hand strikes. He returned headbutts and elbow strikes, but neither of us was able to deliver a decisive strike. Maybe we were both exhausted or maybe the blood in our eyes prevented us from aiming clearly at the target. After all, the 40 minutes ran out and the match ended in a draw. (laughs) I don't know, I didn't look for that one on YouTube to see if it's on there. Uh, getting into the final years. Kimura returned to Japan, retired from competition. 1960 took up a position of judo instructor at his alma mater university. 
He was highly successful coach. He trained a bunch of champions. His final years, however, were marred by the petty vindictiveness of the Kodokan authorities who froze his rank at 7th Don because he had refused to return the championship flag he believed he had earned in 1939 and because he had promoted a number of people in Brazil to black belt ranks in judo without authorization from the Kodokan. His professional wrestling experience also upset powerful figures who controlled judo rank and who thought he had demeaned the art by engaging in this form of entertainment he remained a seventh Don from the age of 30 until of his death at 75. I'm going to close this out here. He says, Kimura never lost his spirit, however. He continued to teach and train even while many of those he had defeated were promoted to 8th, ninth, and even 10th Don. In the early 1990s, Kimura, a lifelong smoker, was diagnosed with lung cancer. Hospitalized after surgery. And in his 70s, Kimura started doing push-ups in his room. He died on April 18th, 1993, at the age of 75, arguably the best judo competitor ever and one of the most important judo figures ever to be mistreated by the leaders of his art. So there you go. Um... Always important to know your history. Always important to know your roots. Always important to learn some lessons here. And uh, just a cool book from Christopher M. Clark. Once again, the book is called The Triumphs and Tragedy of One of Japan's Greatest and Most Controversial Judo Champions. Um, good place to learn some lessons and to see where we can improve, where we can become stronger, faster, smarter, better, See where we can become a little bit more like Kimura. So there you go. Mm -hmm. Echo, Charles, if we're going to be getting better, we're going to need to fuel the system. We got some Jocko Fuel. Some JockoFuel.com. I was up at this big food expo thing. Mm -hmm. Sure. And at this big food expo, I saw a bunch of people there. They're coming up to me and they're saying, I didn't know you made supplements. I didn't know you made an energy drink. I didn't know you made a protein drink. Mm hmm. A, a decent amount of people. I would say half the people that yeah. came and said hi to me were like, oh, I didn't know you had this. Yeah. Which means I know I do a terrible job of putting the word out there. Yeah. So jockofuel.com, we make the best supplements in the world. Straight yep. up. Yep. So check that out. Check out jockofuel.com. Get yourself some ready to drink mole. Get yourself one of these drinks here. Mm-hmm. Energy drinks. Energy drinks. <laughs> sure. uh, Without the stigma, by the way. With, yeah, Healthy. that's good for you. Your kids can drink it. Yeah. You know, like the, we made it as good as you can possibly make these things. So we got stuff for your joints. If you're going to be doing judo, judo and jiu-jitsu and wrestling and Muay Thai and boxing, your, your joints are going to be need a little, they're going to need a little comfort. A little love. Need a little, get yourself some joint warfare. Get yourself, get yourself some time war, by the way. Yeah. We're trying not to get older. Yeah. Right? Get that time war. It's basically designed for your entire health profile, especially the longevity profile. So we just brought that out. Check that one out. You can get the stuff at jockofuel.com. You can get it at Wawa. You get the drinks at Wawa. You can get them at Vitamin Shop. You get all the stuff at Vitamin Shop. Military Commissaries, Hannaford's, Dash Stores in Maryland, Wake Fern, ShopRite, Circle K, H-E-B, and Meyer. We got it going on. Um, Circle K. Did I say Circle K? Florida? Yeah. So a bunch of different great stores. You can get this stuff. Uh, also, if you're doing jujitsu, if you're doing judo, you're going to need some gear. You need to wear a gi. OriginUSA.com. Get yourself a gi. Get yourself a rash guard if you're doing no gi. Get yourself some spats if you're wearing spats. or Get yourself some shorts. All the stuff made in America. No, no one's being enslaved like they are if you buy some other brand that's that's contracting out a sweatshop in Southeast Asia mm-hmm. or in China to make your gear by some 11 year old girl that's getting paid 12 cents a day. Don't do, don't participate in that, no reason. Made in America. Even the fabrics are made in America. Boots, jeans, joggers, t-shirts, hoodies. OriginUSA.com, go get some. I wore that light wash Delta 68 oh. yesterday to the mall. 
Okay. I don't go to the mall, yeah. but I did. It was my daughter's birthday, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, things happen. Yeah, yeah, things happen. But the first time I wore the light wash mm -hmm. during the day where I could see. Yeah, very comfortable, actionable. You mm -hmm. know, you can do some squats if you want in them. I didn't. But I did get this, a massive compliment from my lovely wife. And she said? They look good on you. There you go. There you okay. go. So fashion and function. Yeah. On that one. I'm That's more focused on note. the function thing, but yep. obviously... Mrs. Charles is focused on the f the fashion side. Hey, if you're gonna get a fashion compliment from someone who it means something to and from, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> or USA.com to go check it out. That's a good one. Also, Jocko's store called Jocko Store. This is where you can represent shirts, hats, hoodies, all that stuff. Discipline equals freedom. Represent that on this path. We're not training nine hours a day necessarily, mm -hmm. but if you are, I ain't, I'm not gonna say nothing. Yeah, get your bench Props. on. Props. Yes. Whatever you like. Nonetheless, you're representing while you're doing these things or just cruising, just walking around, whatever. You can do that and you can get it from chocolatestore.com. Also, there's a shirt locker. You want a new shirt every month with different types of cool designs. Still representing the path, by the way, but it's a subscription scenario. So, yeah, check that one out. It's called the shirt locker. It's on chocolatestore.com. Subscribe to the podcast. Check out Jocko Underground. JockoUnderground.com. We're about to record one of those actually when we get done here. We cover some other topics. We do Q&A. It's also a platform that we own. So we can say whatever we want. We can't get banned. It's banned proof. It's cancel proof. If you can't afford $8.18 a month, we get it. It's okay. Email assistance at jockounderground.com. But we just want you there with us in the underground. Don't forget we have a YouTube channel. Subscribe to that. Origin USA, Jocko Fuel also have YouTube channels. We have Psychological Warfare. We got Flipside Canvas. Bunch of books. This here book, once again, Kimura, The Triumphs and Tragedy of One of Japan's Greatest and Most Controversial Judo Champions. It's written by Christopher M. Clark. So check that out. Get yourself some history. Know your history. Don't forget about the Way of the Warrior Kids books. I mean, come on. You want your kid to be raised with discipline, but it's hard to impose it on them. But when they voluntarily want it because they understand it, it's gonna make your whole life better and it's gonna make their lives better. Way of the Warrior Kids series. Go check those out. Obviously, I've written a bunch of other books as well. We also have a leadership consultancy. Go to echelonfront.com if you need help inside your organization. We can solve all your problems through leadership. We have a online training program for that. It's called extremeownership.com. Go to extremeownership.com, take courses. Come and ask me questions. I'm on there live once a week. You can just sit there and ask me about what's going on with your coworker, what's going on with your husband, what's going on with your wife, what's going on with your kids, what's going on with jujitsu. You got a question to ask, come and ask it. Live better. Extremeownership.com. Also, if you want to help families, service members, active and retired, you want to help Gold Star Families. Check out Mark Lee's mom, Mama Lee. She's got a great charity organization. If you want to donate or you want to get involved, go to americasmightywarriors.org. And don't forget about Micah Fink, heroesandhorses.org. Latest update from the wilderness. Mm -hmm. Apparently at this time, Micah Fink is in a snow cave. Damn. He has killed a mountain lion and he is making a jacket. <laughs> From the mountain lion skin. Damn. That's what's going on. That's the latest report. It's legit. You know, yeah. unverified at this time. Sure. But you know, we have faith. If you want to connect with us on the on the social media, Echoes at Echo Charles. I'm at Jocko Willing. Just watch out for the algorithm. It's there. It's there. It's 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 literally artificial intelligence that's meant to make you watch it more. That's its whole purpose. Yeah. You want, people are like, oh, AI is not going to be evil. And some people are like, oh, AI is evil. I'm going to tell you that AI is evil. It's a little dopamine dealer, and it's in there going, tick, 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 spreading it around. Got you. Isn't it embarrassing that it gets you? Yeah. Kind of embarrassing. It feels embarrassing, yeah. But Why? What do you mean? It feels, <laughs> but it's not? I'll put it this way. I don't discount what I'm up against. So mm -hmm. uh, in hindsight, mm -hmm. you see what I'm saying? Because the thing is made specifically, just like how you said. Yeah. Made specifically it for knows, you, for you. Like mm -hmm. in a way, it probably is not doesn't think it's evil. It probably thinks it's good. It's probably like, hey, you know what? Oh, I care it's about doing you. its job. Yeah, yeah, it's doing yeah. its job. 
It cares about you. It cares. The internet knows what you like because yeah. you told it what it like. That's what like you like. a smothering mother that thinks she's doing a good thing by like smothering the kid yeah. with you know all this love and joy and toys and cookies and crackers yeah. and that kid ends up weak. It's true. That's a perfect analogy. Like, oh, I saw his 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 beautiful smile after I gave him that cupcake. Yeah. So what am I do? Another one. Give him another one. Maybe another flavor. Dopamine, 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 dopamine. <laughs> All right. So watch out for that algorithm. Watch out for that dopamine dealer that's locked inside your phone waiting to get out. He doesn't even, he's working 24 hours a day, by the way. He's a freaking robot. He doesn't get, he's not getting paid. He's just in there, just, just uh, an inanimate thing is taking your time, stealing your life from you. Just watch out for it. And thanks to all the true warriors in our military that are out there on the front lines protecting freedom around the world. Also, thanks to our police and law enforcement, firefighters, paramedics, EMTs, dispatchers, correctional officers, border patrol, secret service, all first responders. Thank you for protecting us here at home. And to everyone else out there, you know, there's a, doing my research on Kimura, there's an interview from a 1987 issue of Full Contact Karate Magazine. And curious, there's a bunch of stuff, you can Google it, but one thing he says is, you can't just lie around sleeping like everybody else. <laughs> yeah. That's how he trained three times harder than his opponents. That's how he was lifting, that's how he was training, that's how he was conditioning. That's what he did, that's how he became champion, by getting up every day and getting after it. And I actually recommend that you do the same. And until next time, this is Echo and Jocko, out.